Uh, before we dive into our panel discussion, and we have some of our panel seated already, um, we want to provide just a little bit of background on the Environmental Law and Policy Annual Review, or LPAR, as we affectionately uh, call it. This is an over 15-year collaboration, which is just incredible, uh, between Environmental Law Institute and Vanderbilt Law School. And we just want to give a brief overview for everyone of what we're trying to accomplish with this project and how we picked the articles that you're going to hear about today. So we're going to do this brief intro, and then we'll turn to our first panel. I'm going to hand it to Professor Mike Vandenberg at the Law School to just give us a, an overview of what we're trying to accomplish. Thanks so much. Welcome to everyone. It's great to see alums in the audience from LPAR. Welcome, everyone. An amazing panel already here. We've got three great panels today. And I want to say a little bit about what LPAR is, and, uh, and then we'll go from there. So uh, Linda worked uh, on environmental issues in the White House. Uh, I served as the EPA chief of staff. We both uh, looked for and followed academic literature in the environmental area before we got into the jobs we had. And yet almost none of the academic literature was that useful to us. When people needed uh, a can opener, they just imagined one. Uh, and yet you can't do that in government. And so we both concluded that when we got into a more academic setting, we really wanted to find a way to transition ideas from the academy into the actual practicing world, which explains why we try to find first-rate academic pieces that have feasible implications, and then we try to test those ideas out with the kind of panels you're going to be seeing today. So that's one of the functions of what we're trying to do, to, to do here. A second function is that we wanted to create an opportunity to create incentives for academics to write policy relevant pieces. And I don't know about some of the academics in the room today, but I know that the first three or four pieces that I wrote, having come out of government, having come out of private practice, every one of my most wise colleagues said, cut the last third of the paper. <laughs> and what was that last third? It was where I said what you should actually do as a result of these really cool theoretical ideas I had or cool empirical work. And that didn't seem adequate to me. Uh, and it seems in the long run to create sort of an existential risk. Like what happens if you're actually not making a difference? So another goal we have is to try to stimulate and reward feasible idea generation out of the academy and induce people. And you're going to see that today, induce people to be able to um, to generate those kind of ideas and to want it to generate them. The third and most important goal of all of this, you'll see also throughout the day today, which is that we wanna provide a first rate student journal, right? And a first rate publication uh, with collaboration from ELI for our students. And so you're going to see students today making presentations, moderating panels, um, playing a range of different roles. The students are the core of what we do here. And I appreciate you all coming to DC to do this and all the work you've generated through the course of the year. We select articles in ways that we'll hear more about in just a minute. But the idea again is to provide a journal experience for students, uh, but also to give them the chance to have the kinds of experiences that new lawyers have, moderating panels, picking out articles, interacting with some of the key experts in the field. And we have many of them on the panels today. So that's where we're headed today, yeah. and uh, we're excited to do this. This is roughly 15 years that this has been going on now, and uh, we're really excited about the success. And I want to thank, while he's here, our, our, our one of our first authors, um, J.B. Rule, who is my co-director on the Energy, Environment, and Land Use Program, who's been a big supporter of LPAR through his time at, at Bandy, and we do appreciate that. Absolutely. All right, so we're going to hand it to Kristen Sarna, who is our superstar editor-in-chief and a Vanderbilt 3L, and she's just going to tell us a little bit about the process that got us here. Yeah, thank you. Um, good morning and welcome, everyone. We are so excited to have you joining us today. Um, like Professor Bregan said, my name is Kristen Sarna, and I have the privilege of serving as the editor in chief of the 2022 2023 LPAR edition. Um, before I jump into talking about the article selection process, I want to quickly thank the hard work of some individuals that made all of this possible. Um, first of all, I want to thank our 21 student editors who have worked so hard over the past year to select these articles and prepare for this conference, as well as the work of Professors Bregan and Vandenberg and ELI Research Associate Tori Rickman. Um, this wouldn't be possible without all these people and all the hard work that they put into this conference and our upcoming publication. 
And I also want to thank our advisory committee, Vanderbilt Law School, and of course the Environmental Law Institute. So before we get into our panel discussion, I'm going to briefly describe the LPAR article selection process that led us to selecting the three articles that we will be discussing during the conference today. LPAR is a joint publication with the Environmental Law Institute that takes place in the August edition of the Environmental Law Reporter. We republish in shortened form with expert commentary some of the best environmental law and policy proposals and legal academic scholarship each year. 20 Vanderbilt Law School students typically participate in the LPAR process. Our article selection process begins by logging every article that mentions the word environment, published in the law reviews of schools ranked in the US News Top 100, as well as a variety of environmental law specific publications. This year, our students logged over 900 articles. <laughs> We then screen these articles down to around 200 articles that discuss the environment in a meaningful and relevant way. After evaluating these article proposals based on our four LPAR criteria, which are creativity, persuasiveness, impact, and feasibility, the articles are summarized by students and then discussed by the entire class under the guidance of Professors Bregan and Vandenberg. This process takes place over the course of two semesters and culminates in a top 20 list of the most exciting and innovative environmental law and policy articles that we want to highlight. Our expert advisory committee works with the class to help narrow down that pool from 20 to just three to five articles that will be published in the August edition of ELI's Environmental Law Reporter. We are incredibly excited to be able to highlight three of those articles during our conference today. Thank you again for joining us and we hope you enjoy the conference. Thank you, Kristen, and uh, thank you to our advisory committee. Some members are sitting in the audience, so thank you so much. We uh, really appreciate your input on the selection process. And um, before we get going with the first panel, Henry Woods, who's our development editor this year, is just going to do a little snapshot of what was in the pool, because I think it's really interesting. What was in the pool of articles? Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, you just tell Tori and she will magically turn that on. <laughs> or not. Uh, you know, I'm just going to say, be patient, webinar participants, be patient. We have not done an in-person <laughs> hybrid event in three years. And I will tell you, we spent the better part of a whole day testing everything. And I can absolutely <laughs> tell you that something will go wrong. So <laughs> Patience. Yeah, so uh, good morning. My name is Henry Woods. I'm a third year law student. I've had the honor of serving as LPAR's development editor this year. As part of my role, I keep track of the data and trends in environmental law scholarship. This morning, I'd like to give you a brief snapshot of the environmental publication data we have recorded this year. As Kristen described, we have established a methodology for evaluating articles and collecting data. If you're interested in a more detailed look at this process, the full information on our methodology can be found at the link on the ELI website. This year, we analyzed 271 environmental law articles. When members read through an article to assess whether it's an environmental article, they consider whether environmental law and policy are a substantial focus of the article and whether environmental topics were given more than incidental treatment and were integral to the main thrust of the article. Of these 271 environmental law articles, 71 came from general law reviews and 200 came from environmental law journals. We define environmental law journals as US-based specialty journals listed in the environment and land use and energy and natural resources subject areas of the most recent rankings mm -hmm. compiled by Washington Lee University School of Law. Additionally, as you heard from Kristen, only articles from law reviews of the top 100 law schools based on the most recent rankings by US News and World Report are looked at for inclusion in LPAR. We classify the articles into 10 top topic categories, which are set up by the Environmental Law Reporter's Subject Matter Index. These topics include air, climate change, energy, governments, land use, natural resources, toxic substances, waste, water, and wildlife. Articles receive a primary topic and also a secondary topic if applicable. The environmental articles published from August 2021 to July 2022 included 86 governance articles, 
38 water articles, 38 climate change articles, 37 land use articles, 30 energy articles, 13 wildlife articles, 11 natural resources articles, 10 toxic substances articles, six waste articles, and two air articles. You can see each group, group each grouped by percentages here. We also gathered data about article subtopics. Here are the subtopics with the largest representation with those that have only one or two articles so designated combined under other. 13 subtopics are included under other with wilderness infrastructure of states, fisheries, pesticides, and clean air act being the most represented. Here we have examined the breakdown of governance articles from the 2021 to 2022 cycle, which is particularly salient as the governance category casts a wide net with, 20, 20, with 22 different subcategories. This year, many of the governance subtopics were consolidated and the private governance subtopic was introduced as well. That sounds like an important development. <laughs> it is really interesting though, like when we started this 15 years ago, no climate change articles, right? I mean, it's been really interesting to watch it evolve, no energy articles. And for those of you who are afraid you might miss some of the substance of what Henry said, we do publish these data yes. as a part of a summary when yeah. LPAR comes out each August. It gives the yeah. students a publication opportunity and it'll, it'll have these data. And in, the slides will be available as well. Right. Um, yeah, so this, this chart tracks the secondary topics for articles where this was applicable. As many articles could be identified as falling under the broad net of governance, another topic were equally applicable to the article, we labeled governance as the secondary topic, which is why governance is by far the largest secondary topics here represented. Additionally, not all articles had a secondary topic, this chart only representing 149 of the 271 articles. Out of our top 20 articles chosen for 2021 to 2022, six were from environmental law journals and 14 were from general law reviews. Within this top 20, we had a range of primary topics, with the most common being energy, governance, and climate change. You can see the secondary topics as well, although not every article had a secondary topic as previously mentioned. In our top 20, two articles called for changes in the judicial system by revitalizing old doctrine, four articles proposed updates to federal laws, five articles called for federal agencies to promulgate new or updated regulations, Two articles focused on state or local policy solutions, five articles offered private environmental governance solutions, and two articles called for broad paradigm shifts, such as redesign adaptation in response to climate change. We had a great pool of articles to choose from this year, and we're excited to discuss some of them today. With that, I'll hand it back to Professor Bregan. Great. Thank you, Henry and Kristen and, and Mike. And I do want to also just do a special welcome for the LPAR students and LPAR alum who are in the audience. It's um, wonderful to have everyone here. And we also have some Vanderbilt students on the webinar. We really did just have a terrific class this year and, and just great, uh, great discussions in, in class. I do need to say a very special thank you to Tori Rickman, who is the research associate is working on um, LPAR for ELI. She's just basically did all the heavy lifting to get this conference together and did a terrific job. And also thank you to uh, Colin Gibson Cancel, our tech manager who is on the webinar managing that. And, and I am not texting my friends. I'm texting <laughs> the tech to make sure everything's going okay on the webinar uh, front as well. So um, basically my job today is just to move us along as uh, efficiently as possible. So the format for each panel is going to be as follows. We're going to hear from the authors. Then we're going to hear from each commenter. Then we're going to give the authors a chance to respond to what they've heard, which is always interesting. And then the LPAR student editor, who's going to start by introducing the panel, will also ask the first question. And then we'll go to uh, question and answers from the audience. And I will try to go back and forth and take some from the webinar participants and some from 
uh, the audience. Um, and I hope the speakers do not mind. I will be making faces at them if they're running over because we do have a very, uh, really, really tight uh, schedule today. Um, and, and the breaks are short. And the reason they're short is because we don't want to leave our webinar participants alone for too long. But by all means, if you need to take more time, take more time, come and go from the room as you need to. I know that we are on a tight break, tight uh, schedule. We have coffee and snacks in here. We're going to have box lunches later that you can pick up and having your seat. And um, I hope everyone here will stay for the reception at two o'clock and get to meet some of the uh, Vanderbilt uh, law students. For those of you on the webinar, if you have any tech problems, use the chat and uh, you will be able to communicate with our top notch tech team. And um, I do want to, and, if, and for those of you on the webinar, use the question box for uh, questions. I'll be looking through them and posing some of them um, to our panelists. And uh, lastly, the audio recording of today will be posted on the LPAR website. And as I noted earlier, the slides will be available as well. So thank you so much for joining us. I think it's going to be a really interesting day. Did you want to say Can something? Can I just say that, that Anna has the most amazing timing of anyone I've ever seen. <laughs> Trying to exactly the right time. To get the In the audience. Okay. I don't think it's the right thing. We're just glad you're here. We're glad all of you are here. So I'm going to hand it over to Chris. Burroughs, who is the article editor and Vanderbilt Law student for this panel, and he's going to introduce. Oh, that's not going to work. See? Yeah. It's just, it's, uh, the best laid plan. There we go. <laughs> we practiced that, too. You wouldn't know. This was an extremely uh, popular panel, and everybody wanted to comment, and so we ran out of space. The others will not be as good. Right. Hello and good morning. I'm Chris Burroughs. Um, I'm one of the article editors for LPAR and currently a third-year law student at Vanderbilt Law School. And today, it's my pleasure to introduce both the authors and the commenters for our first article today, uh, Four Degrees Celsius by J.B. Rule and Robin Cundis Craig, originally published in the Minnesota Law Review. And so first I'd like to introduce our co-authors. J.B. Rule is the David Daniels Allen Distinguished Chair in Law at Vanderbilt University, as well as the Director of the Program on Law and Innovation and the Co-Director of the Energy, Environment, and Land Use Program at Vanderbilt Law School, where he teaches several courses, including first-year property law, which I had the privilege of taking, as well as a seminar on climate change governance. He received his BA and JD degrees from the University of Virginia and his LLM in environmental law from the George Washington University Law School. In addition, he holds a PhD in geography from Southern Illinois University. Professor ruled influential scholarly articles relating to climate change, the Endangered Species Act, ecosystems, governance, and other environmental and natural resources law issues have appeared in the Duke, Georgetown, Stanford, and other law journals and leading peer-reviewed scientific journals as well. Robin Cundis Craig is the Robert C. Packard Trustee Chair in Law at the USC Gould School of Law, where she teaches environmental law, water law, ocean and coastal law, toxic tort, civil procedure, and administrative law. She received her BA from Pomona College in Claremont, California, her MA in writing about science from the Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, her PhD in English literature, specializing in how the English romantic poets use con contemporary science to explain social change from the University of California, Santa Barbara, and her JD, summa cum laude, with a certificate in environmental law from the Lewis and Clark School of Law in Portland, Oregon, my home state. Mm -hmm. She is the author, co-author, or editor of 13 books and has written or co-written over 100 law or science journal articles and book chapters. Professor Craig is an elected member of the American Law Institute and the American College of Environmental Lawyers and a member of the International Union for Conservation of Nature's World Commission on Environmental Law. And next, I would like to briefly introduce our distinguished commenters this morning, uh, starting from the end there. Um, Dr. Rod Schoonover is the CEO and founder of the Ecological Futures Group an organization dedicated to examining ecological disru disruptions implications for national and global security. He is also a senior associate of the Center for Strategic Inter International Studies and adjunct professor at Georgetown University, where he teaches climate science. He earned his PhD in theoretical chemical physics at the University of Michigan, where he studied complex systems. 
Dr. Schoonover previously served for a decade in the U.S. intelligence community as the Director of Environment and Natural Resources at the National Intelligence Council in the Office of the Director of National Intelligence and a Senior Scientist and Senior Analyst in the State Department's Bureau of Intelligence and Research. Carlos Evans is currently the Director of the Office of, Bar of Environmental Quality and Sustainability for the City of Dallas, Texas. He received his BA from the University of Michigan and his JD from Howard University School of Law. Prior to starting his current job in 2022, he spent two decades as an attorney at the US Environmental Protection Agency. His areas of ex expertise include air and cleanup enforcement, environmental sustainability and resilience and environmental justice. Anna Viscar is a senior attorney at the nonprofit environmental law firm Earth Justice based here in Washington, D.C., where she advocates for and defends strong federal climate action. She received her B.A. from Pomona College and her J.D. from Georgetown University Law Center. Before joining Earth Justice, she was a staff attorney at Harvard Law School's Environmental and Energy Law Program, where she analyzed federal climate, environmental, and energy regulation and policy and studied private sector responses to climate change. She previously practiced environmental law with two national law firms, where she worked on complex environmental litigation, compliance, and transactional matters. And lastly, Dr. Joel Sharaga is the Senior Advisor for Climate Change Adaptation in the, in the Office of the Administrator at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. He received an A.B. in Geology and Mathematics and Physics, along with an M.A. in Economics from Brown University, and holds a Ph.D. in Economics from the same institution. A central focus of his work is supporting states, tribes, territories, local communities, and businesses as they prepare for and increase their resilience to the impacts of climate change. Dr. Sharaga led the team that developed EPA's new Climate Adaptation Action Plan and was also a lead author for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2007. In December 2015, Dr. Sharaga was honored with a Presidential Rank Award, the highest honor given to career members of the Federal Senior Executive Service. Thank you, Chris. As you can see, we have a real group of underachievers here. <laughs> We're going to hand it over to Professors Rule and Dennis Thank you. Thank you. Well, okay, we're starting the day with doom and gloom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but first, uh, on behalf of both of us, thank you to LPAR uh, for organizing this event and the article selection and editing process. LPAR is truly, the true sense of the word, a unique student experience in legal education. There's nothing else like it. And I think it, it's really uh, very distinctive and, and rewarding for our students to see some of the former LPAR students uh, in the audience. Uh, also, thanks to Mike and Linda for creating LPAR and sustaining it so ably, and of course, to all the students. Uh, knowing how much thought and effort the LPAR team puts into their article selection and editing process, it's a tremendous honor to have had our article selected. Thanks also to ELI. It also is a truly unique institution in environmental law and policy. It is uh, long provided uh, a robust uh, um, place for convening, uh, collaborating, and innovating. Thank you also to the panelists. And first, thanks to my co author, Robin. <laughs> uh, both enjoy writing the kind of scholarship that connects with LPAR's criteria. And it's even better when we get to do that together. So I'm going to provide Kind of the setup, the background of the article, why we undertook writing it and its central theme, and then Robin will explain uh, some of the details in the proposal. I think it's fair to say that Robin and I were among the first in the legal academies well over a decade ago to advocate for increased policy attention devoted to climate change adaptation. Uh, we and others working on that theme got pushed back, some of it aggressively. Uh, the idea being that promoting adaptation would lead to complacency and undercut mitigation policy. But our position was, hey, climate change is already here. Uh, the need for adaptation will be inevitable. Uh, but that resistance uh, had led to what we call an adaptation deficit. Uh, we needed to start thinking about adaptation planning and policy fast. The resistance softened. And I think by 2015, it's fair to say there was a robust dialogue in legal scholarship on adaptation policy, but actual on the ground planning was still getting off to a slow start. Looking back on that pivotal year, the Paris Agreement ironically helped 
lead what we call uh, the coupling of mitigation and adaptation policy in the sense that both became locked on Paris Agreement's goals of keeping warming to under 1.5 at worst case under 2.0. With those internationally committed goals for mitigation, it made sense to use them as a platform for building adaptation scenarios as well. I think it's fair to say also that the sense in the United States was we're going to be dealing with climate change, but it's going to be a lot worse elsewhere. In fact, to the extent that climate migration was a policy topic, it referred to people leaving other nations, more distressed nations, to seek climate refuge in the United States. Most adaptation planning at the federal, state, and local levels fit into what we call in the article of climate proofing or in situ climate adaptation. <clears throat> the idea was that there is a strategic blend of resisting threats such as sea winds, building resilience such as through better flood management, and to a much lesser extent at that time, managed retreats such as pulling back from coastal areas. Uh, we could deal with climate change in situ and keep communities basically intact. Some local plans did discuss more extreme scenarios, but really did not put that to the test in their actual planning and policy. By 2020, if you were uh, like we were wonks on climate science, right, dig digging into the climate science uh, in the most prominent scientific journals, it was clear that the chances of achieving 1.5 degrees centigrade as our upper level uh, were approaching zero. And the probability of blowing past 2.0 was rising and likely already past more probable than not. Depends on, you know, what you read and what you believe. But in any event, uh, the, cl the climate change goals in the Paris Agreement were uh, diminishing in probability. Well, uh, that was the premise for our paper. And uh, we expected some resistance to that conclusion among our law professor colleagues and other readers. So we devoted 13 pages of this <laughs> article uh, to making the point uh, using the best science and synthesizing it and translating it into policy. Make the point that we need to begin thinking about a beyond two degrees C world. We worked in great detail uh, through the current state of science, emissions, climate conditions, carbon budgets, emissions trajectory, and the latest research on climate sensitivity. In a, one of the footnotes, we suggested that, well, maybe in 10 years, uh, that part wouldn't be necessary anymore because we need to be living in a 1.5 degree world already, or that would be a given. And last week's IPCC report, at least on the 1.5 degree C goal, uh, suggests that uh, that will be the case and it would save us a lot of work. <laughs> so I do commend the LSAR students who edited our article for condensing that 13 pages into two paragraphs. <laughs> Point. There you go. Uh, so in short, there seems to be little debate with the last sentence of that now shortened discussion. Barring rapid global political, social, and technological transformation, we will be fortunate to limit temperature rise to 2.6 degrees centigrade possibility of reaching four degrees centigrade cannot be ignored. But taking that as a starting point, the central argument of our article is that mitigation policy and adaptation policy yes. must be decoupled to allow adaptation policy to actively engage beyond two degrees C scenarios without giving up on below two degrees C, C scenarios as the motivation for mitigation policy. We're neutral in the article on whether the 1.5, 2.0 targets should remain the stated mitigation goals. That's a complex question. But we're anything but neutral in the article on whether adaptation policy needs to move on and begin planning for extreme disruptions that swamp the resilience, resilience retreat strategies. In particular, we need to consider how we will adapt to how we adapt. In other words, through you know, migration and other decisions, right? So we're not just adapting to climate change, we're adapting to human social adaptation to climate change. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Robin to outline how we envision that adaptation policy design and our proposal. Thanks, Robin. All right. Well, thank you, JB. I want to echo JB's thanks to uh, uh, LPAR, to ELI, to our commentators. Uh, 
And I want to add one last thank you, which is to the Minnesota Law Review that agreed to go with a three character title. No <laughs> title. <laughs> so uh, that, that was something JB and I insisted on early uh, on, and, and it was nice of them to do that. But uh, so picking up where JB left off, um, you know, governance of and during extreme climate change uh, will increasingly become more difficult. And that was one of the main points we wanted to make. Uh, and to try and take a first stab at imagining uh, what that governance is going to have to be grappling with, uh, what what it actually looks like on the ground to try to be um, successfully governing uh, everything that's changing all at the same time. Uh, as Jamie mentioned in passing, we settled on migration as kind of a focal point, uh, as a a common thread uh, that came up among everyone who's trying to envision this future. Uh, and it's kind of a universal thread in the sense that it's not just hum humans that will be moving around, uh, but other species and ecosystems. And so everything is in motion all at once. Uh, however, as JB also mentioned in passing, uh, we changed the focus from uh, international migration, which is immigration, human rights, in, uh, international law issue too, hey, we're going to have a lot of movement just within the United States. Let's keep this at the United States level and think about what that actually means. So uh, governing this world uh, requires moving beyond those three R's of resist, resilience, uh, and retreat uh, into something we call redesign adaptation, which means re-envisioning where people need to be, where they are probably going to try to be being, uh, movement of population, changes in land use, changes in your natural resource base, uh, changes in economic production, and the list goes on. So uh, everything needs to shift. We need to be housing people in different places. We need to have the infrastructure in place to do that. Oh, and by the way, while we're doing all this, we should be leaving some corridors open for the other species that are trying to adapt to the changes that are going on. So that was kind of our vision. Uh, and one thing we wanted to remind uh, everyone of in this article is environmental law and policy have decades now of developing some pretty cool tools. It's not like we're going into this challenge without some ideas of uh, tools we can put in place. So uh, our scale ran from laissez-faire to federal preemption and mandates. Uh, Laissez-faire, we're thinking in terms of market signals, and particularly we focused on insurance. Uh, insurance signals could already be driving more adaptation policy than they do, uh, but our problem so far is that governments rush in where insurance companies fear to tread uh, and keep insuring risky behaviors that are not money makers. So, uh, uh, that, that could be a great starting signal for the adaptation process is when insurance companies say it's time to leave, probably everybody else should agree with that. <laughs> um, we then got into planning tools uh, uh, in terms of needing to think about spatial rearrangements, infrastructure needs in different places, infrastructure decommissionings in certain places. Uh, and directed research uh, by economists, by social scientists, by psychologists, and of course by engineers and hard science to figure out where uh, the, the uh, problems are that we need to solve. Uh, from there, we get into prodding, uh, which goes with reinforcing that insignia, uh, insurance signal, uh, tweaking our disaster relief, which we don't think will stop. In fact, I think it shouldn't stop, but it can be tweaked to promote adaptation goals rather than leaving everybody in situ. Uh, review subsidies uh, and rever uh, remove the perverse incentives that we have all known for decades are in there. Uh, add some tax incentives, perhaps. And perhaps the most controversial recommendation we came up with is we may have to go back to land giveaways because where federal lands and national parks and things like that, all those places we treasure need to be, might be different than where they are now. So, you know, one very effective history has proven mechanism for getting people to move where you want them to be is to give them free land. So, 
Uh, and then, like I said, at the end of preemption uh, and mandates, if you're talking about national scale rearrangement, uh, by definition, there's going to have to be a heavier federal hand in this. Uh, local government, local government's plan for in situ adaptation, in part because that is where they have governance control. Uh, and so we, we need a, a heavier federal hand in all this. Uh, our models in thinking about this tended to come back to uh, the dust bowl migrations uh, and the uh, ramp up after, uh, after Pearl Harbor for World War II uh, and the, the various public works programs going on in the Great Depression. Uh, but another series of public works prog uh, programs and social support mechanisms are going to be necessary as well. So our, our policy recommendation, I do realize we're coming up on the end of our 15 minutes, uh, <laughs> is that we need to engage in, uh, in um, anticipatory governance, thinking about what the governance needs are, gonna need, are going to be 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 50 years. From now, anticipatory governance is a growing field uh, of governance uh, research, um, and we think that should be aided by a, a new, um, intensely interdisciplinary. Uh, and and when we say intensely interdisciplinary, if you can think of it, they should be involved in this group. Uh, <laughs> Jamie and I uh, had the great pleasure of being in an intensely interdisciplinary uh, group working on. Um, adaptive governance issues uh, in the context of water, it helped tremendously to have some psychologists in the room uh, and some social scientists. So uh, intensely disciplinary, um, non-policy making body, we thought that was important. Uh, you don't want the people doing the evaluations to be the ones that are subject to the politics of making the final policy call. I, who are basically sitting around dreaming up all the different ways the future might play out, both in terms of how climate change impacts the United States, but also how human beings are reacting to that. And uh, are we going to have panics? Are we going to have orderly moving around? Are we going to have armed insurrections in some parts of the country? All of that needs to be part of the consideration. Uh, so that we can come up with various scenarios of how our future might in, uh, unfold and what governance responses are going to be needed. And are we going to, which is almost certainly going to be true, are we going to need different kinds of governance responses in different parts of the United States to achieve different uh, adaptation goals? So um, that's a summary of where we ended up, and that was our yeah. recommendation. So, and you can see why the article was picked because it's <laughs> chock full. Of, no, I mean really thoughtful, really thoughtful analysis and recommendation. Can I have just one thing? Just thirty yeah. seconds. Yeah, of course. It's uh, just to emphasize uh, about six months after our article came out, a team of client scientists uh, published an article in PNAS, one of the most influential mm -hmm. journals. Uh, essentially saying the same thing from their point of view, that we need to actually start designing scenarios of beyond two degrees C because we're likely headed there. And uh, we had a little exchange of letters. Uh, they, <laughs> their idea for how to do it was a little different than ours, but you know, mm -hmm. pretty much the same. And you know, a lot, a lot of common ground. So it's just interesting to see this also coming from the science, the climate science side as well as the policies. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so we're going to turn now uh, to Carlos Evans in the city of Dallas to give a, a little perspective on this. We're going to get a lot of perspectives <laughs> on this. So. Yes, good morning. Uh, so Carlos Evans, city of Dallas, uh, Department of uh, Office of Environmental Quality and Sustainability. And this is a very complicated and intriguing topic. Um, as you know, city of Dallas is an inland city. Uh, so this topic is going to be different for inland cities versus coastal cities, right? Uh, so for the city of Dallas, we are focused on uh, realizing a sustainable, uh, 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 um, resilient, and equitable city of Dallas, right? Um, and if redesign adaptation means for us we get more federal funding as we uh, accept more domestic migrants, then that may be a good thing. If, if redesign adaptation means that we're asking the city of Dallas residents who love their city to go to Oklahoma and 
most are not necessarily fond of Oklahoma, <laughs> then um, that's going to be a completely different issue, right? So, um, so, uh, and and it, but anticipatory governance, uh, you know, if, if there's a federal agency planning this out and and providing policy recommendations to council members, and you know, so for example, my my role is I provide recommendations to our council members. We have 15, 14 council members and, and a mayor. Um, if I'm up there telling them, look, this federal agency is saying, and, and I don't know what that was, but it's saying, in, 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 <laughs> it's saying in 15 to 20 years, uh, you know, we're going to have to move to Oklahoma. Um, it, you know, that 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 provides some some uh, data and scientific uh cover for me to say that, but I don't, I don't know if that's going to go over well. Um, uh, so, but let me run through some, some slides uh, just to show you where we are right now. Again, we're, we're focused on sustainability, resiliency, and equity. Uh, go to the next slide. Next slide. So just to remind, and I don't know how the star got on a different state. The stars are in Texas. Uh, but anyway, so just to remind everybody, uh, Texas, Texas is number one and starred, <laughs> but number one in the wrong way. So we're uh, number one in uh, billion dollar uh, uh, weather and climate disasters and number one in cumulative cost of, uh, uh, of climate disasters uh, since 1980. Uh, we're approximately around 380 billion in costs uh, from climate and weather related disasters. Next slide. As you know, Texas uh, suffers from extreme uh, heating during the, the summer seasons, extreme uh, freezes during the winter seasons. You may recall 2021 uh, extreme weather uh, winter storm Uri, uh, where this whole state lost power. Hundreds uh, were frozen to death in their homes without power and electricity and heat. Um, these are sort of some serious and real issues for, for us. And, and the, uh, the uh, floods, floods are more severe. Uh, as a year progress. Next slide. Uh, as I alluded to before, uh, uh, city of Dallas is uh, a destination city for a lot of uh, inland residents. So uh, because of Hurricane Katrina, Rita, Harvey, a lot of folks uh, coming from the Gulf Coast to the city of Dallas, one of the reasons why city of Dallas is growing as well as headquarters to a lot of corporate uh, organizations. Next slide. So uh, in the city, uh, the city of Dallas approved unanimously in 2020, a comprehensive environmental climate action plan. Again, we're focused on climate uh, mitigation, climate adaptation, uh, in, uh, environment, improving environmental quality and environmental justice. Next slide. Uh, eight goals. Uh, we'd like to say it's everything from A to Z, from air quality to zero waste. We're talking about buildings, energy, transportation, water quality, air quality, uh, 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 access to local food, access to healthy and local food, and the like. Next slide. Sorry, I'm trying to get. Right, we appreciate it. <laughs> uh, we're, st we're still we're still striving to avoid 1.5. Um, you know, uh, one of our arguments. I wasn't there at the city. I was at EPA uh, when when the CCAP was passed. But one of the arguments for this was: look, the science says we need to avoid 1.5. Um, that was the scientific backing for our climate action plan. Uh, we have, you know, now that the IPCC report, came, latest IPCC report came out, we have not briefed council on that. Uh, but I think regardless, regardless of whether we're talking about 1.5, 2.6, 4.0, the council members are going to say, look, I need to advocate for my residents who want to stay in, in, in the city of Dallas, uh, whether that means, uh, you know, focusing more on, more on adaptation uh, uh, or uh, focusing more aggressively on both mitigation and adaptation, I think they just want to stay, they want to make sure that we stay in our city. Uh, next slide. So we have 97 actions. Again, so you see a, a focus here. We have 45 mitigation actions, 21 adaptation actions, 20 environmental quality actions, and 11 environmental justice. I think you see the, 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 the essence here being uh, we're trying to get to net zero greenhouse gas. Our, our general goal is trying to get to net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, uh, consistent with the Paris Climate Agreement, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, again, trying to be more aggressive in mitigation uh, so we can meet our, our uh, climate goal. Next slide. Uh, so just running through uh, some of uh, kind of where we are status right now, 
We're trying to work on net zero carbon construction specs. That's still under evaluation. Uh, we're about to adopt some of the 2021 international construction codes, uh, including some requirements for EV readiness and solar, which is not on the slide. We have a whole home program, which uh, provides our residents with information on uh, uh, weatherization, energy efficiency, and uh, renewable uh, energy programs and projects available to them as residents within the city of Dallas. We just uh, we just uh, launched our green job skills program. So this is if you're a contractor within the city of Dallas and you want to get your weatherization certification, um, uh, we will pay for some of your. We will pay only well, we'll we'll pay for fifty people um, some of their some of their courses so they can get their weatherization certification. And we're still working on our community solar. Well, we're trying to develop a community solar uh, uh, project. And um, uh, we're looking at uh, bundling uh, programs for renewable energy. Next slide. Uh, so uh, we, we're, we're, we have approximately uh, 52,000 kilowatt, uh, kilowatt, kilowatts of installed solar. Uh, that's a 58.7% increase since 2020. Uh, we're not Austin, we're not other cities on the West Coast and East Coast, but we're making progress. We're, again, this is our third year uh, implementation of our climate action plan, but we're getting there. Next slide. <laughs> Again, we're not Austin um, uh, or San Francisco or anything like that, but we have 300, approximately 360 uh, EV chargers and uh, approximately 18,500 uh, uh, 18, folks driving around in EVs, um, next to Teslas and others uh, uh, products. So next slide. So when we talk about infrastructure and resiliency, a lot of money is being poured into our water infrastructure, stormwater infrastructure. So we are implementing a $300 million Mill Creek stormwater drainage project uh, on the east side of uh, Dallas. Uh, a lot of flooding uh, concerns. So essentially, uh, the Dallas Water Utilities has uh, burrowed or uh, created a, a storm, huge storm drain from east Dallas to west Dallas to get that water into the Trinity River. So that is a uh, project is uh, underway and almost completed. We're also implementing a $230 million uh, flood, flood protection project uh, that raises and flattens levees. Uh, uh, um, we'll be operating new pumps, pump stations and uh, 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 creating new wetlands. Next slide. Uh, we planted 10, about approximately 10,000 trees in the last couple of years. Plan on doing more, but we're getting there. Uh, next slide. And we just launched a comprehensive urban ag, uh, the city council just approved a comprehensive urban ag plan. We have about 15 acres of urban ag acreage in the city, trying to expand that so that we can uh, significantly, significantly impact our food supply. Once we do that, we'll focus more on uh, 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 consolidate, food consolidation, distribution, and market opportunities. Uh, next slide. So we're again, three, three years in, but we have some awards. Got to say, hey, we're doing great. <laughs> Um, you know, when the latest award is saying we have a top, we have a top climate plan for uh, implementability, you know, so mm -hmm. that's something. Um, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah. So, but again, so we're in, next slide, please. So we're in Texas. So what does that mean? That we have some uh, real uh, political realities uh, from the state legislature. Uh, HB 17 signed in 2021 says that we cannot favor any energy types, right? So that's huge. That's not, so California and other states, you know, they say, you know, they're focused more on electricity, et cetera, renewable energy. As a city, we can't, we can't favor any one type over another. Uh, and there are many bills uh, currently going through state committees, uh, trying to make sure that we uh, do not regulate greenhouse gas emissions or favor uh, a fuel source. So this, one of this, one of the, one of the reasons why this came about is uh, in December, some of our council members on our environment and sustainability council committee uh, prioritize transitioning gas powered landscape equipment to battery, battery and electric powered landscape equipment. They want us to work, we're tasked for bringing a plan before them in June um, to transition out the entire city by 2027. Just talking about city operations, talking about businesses, major, um, me medium, uh, small businesses. We're talking about residents. If you live in the city of Dallas, you're supposed to be getting battery power operating, uh, battery powered equipment. They want us to put together a plan for the entire package by 2027. So, um, you know, in theory, 
that would require a uh, uh, incentivized programs, your buybacks and your, you know, things of that nature and your ordinances. Well, uh, private sector has uh, lobbyists. And so what do they do? Um, so now we have a number of bills uh, in Austin um, saying that, well, we don't necessarily support this. So um, that's one of the reasons why you see some of the bills in the, the, the uh, Austin or state Texas state legislature um, um, right now uh, focused on um, uh, fossil fuel emissions and kind of being neutral on the, on the municipal level. So all, all told, uh, just going back to, I'm not, I'm not sure how much time I have. Did I run over? But you're going to take a couple more minutes. Okay, thank you. And... All right. <laughs> Especially about those awards. We want to yeah. <laughs> so again, so I mean, uh, it's, it's a very complicated, I mean, it's a very, <laughs> very fascinating uh, uh, a topic. And I love, enjoy re reading it and, and just thinking about it. Um, to me, it comes to feasibility on the local level um, because Obviously, they say politics, all politics is local. When you work for a city council, it's really local. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they are, they can, and we, we have districts, right? And so each council member is representing a district and they're focused on their districts. And so, so they don't want to have to go to their uh, residents who have perhaps have been there for generations and say, hey, um, we love, you know, we know you love your TCU, Texas Longhorns, Texas A&M, but, you know, go be a Sooner. You know, um, so that's it's 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 an interesting um, interesting topic um, um, for discussion. Um, but again, if that means that we're a destination city, um, now again, if I'm, I'm Houston, if I'm the director of the environmental department in Houston, that's a completely different story. Then you know that's more more drastic and dramatic, and you've been identified already as having problems. If you're New Orleans, you know you may be, you know you, you know this may be coming. Um, because you're you're losing land uh, land mass already, um, but you know this this concern about migration has not been identified. I think for the city of Dallas, uh, we're we're used to being a, de a destination city uh, for for uh, domestic migrants. So uh, so just to, I guess it depends on where that line is. You know um, where where folks will be living. With that, thank yeah. You. Well, thank you. It's so it's really interesting just to hear how this plays out on the ground, right? And I think what you said is so important about you're not San Francisco, because I work on the ground in Nashville quite a mm. bit, and it does not matter what San Francisco is doing. People do not care, <laughs> and they just go, yeah, that's what happened. But when Dallas is doing it, it makes a difference. And that's part of why I invited you, because you. we look to Dallas, you know, quite a bit. And um, I think it's just really important to remember about this dynamic of, you know, uh, blue cities and red states and what you're trying to navigate in terms of getting things done, whether it's mitigation, you know, or, or adaptation. So um, thank you. And we are going to move next to Joel Schreiber from EPA. Well, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. It, it really is a privilege for me to be here. And Linda and Michael, thank you very much for this opportunity. JB, in his introductory remarks, suggested that we're starting this conference with doom and gloom. Um, I'm going to try to bring a note of optimism and opportunity to the discussion. JB and Robin have written a very, very thought-provoking article and a very important article, and thank you for writing this, this paper. As they acknowledge in, the, in their article, the Earth's climate is changing at an increasingly rapid rate, now outside uh, the range to which human society has had to adapt to in the past. And realistically, as JP uh, suggested, achieving the goal set in the 2015 Paris Agreement of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade, which the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change estimates will actually occur sometime around the first half of the 2030s, which isn't that far away, folks, will be unattainable without drastic actions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And in the absence of any additional efforts to reduce emissions even more, existing and currently planned fossil fuel infrastructure will produce enough greenhouse gases to warm the planet roughly two degrees cent uh, centigrade this century. And I, I have to applaud the importance that JB and Robin place on having concurrent governance efforts to both mitigate, mitigate emissions of greenhouse gases to slow the rate of climate change and slow the rate of warming 
and anticipatory adaptation to, pre to prepare for inevitable impacts. But as you've heard JB and Robin go a step further, as JB said, and I'm gonna quote you, uh, they argue that barring rapid global political, social, and technological transformations, we will be fortunate if we're able to limit temperature rise to two degrees centigrade and the possibility of reaching four degrees centigrade can't be ignored. Clearly, reaching a four degree centigrade world would have potentially catastrophic impacts, catastrophic consequences. However, to put it in perspective, as noted by the IPCC's newly released uh, AR6 synthesis <laughs> report, many of the most dire climate scenarios, once feared by climate scientists, such as a four degree centigrade or more world, look, now look a little more unlikely. A lot of nations like the United States are investing more heavily in clean energy. You just heard about Dallas and wow, I'm, I'm impressed. Um, but uh, nations are investing more heavily in clean energy, which has become much more cost competitive. And at least 18 countries, including the United States have managed to reduce their emissions from, from more than a decade now. However, whether or not one believes a four degree centigrade world is likely, investments in anticipatory adaptation are critically important now and even faster. Why? Well, JB and uh, Robin suggest that scientists are very concerned and have been concerned for quite a while that we are dangerous, dangerously close to passing critical tipping points. I would argue I would go even a step further. I would argue that we have already passed critical tipping points and are continuing to do so. Whether or not a tipping point exists and whether it has been exceeded already depends on the individuals, the communities and ecosystems you're talking about, their geographic location, the particular climate risks they are facing, and I want to emphasize, and the values that they hold about the things that might be lost. And I would suggest to you, Robin uh, uh, referred to uh, uh, the discussion they have about migration, which is very real. I would suggest to you, for example, that the tribal community of Shishmaref in Alaska, whose elderly sadly recently voted to move their entire community to another location, despite the precious cultural resources that they are losing, would say that they've already passed a critical threshold. The bottom line is impacts are already occurring and thresholds, both physical and socioeconomic, are already being exceeded. And I wanna be clear, I'm not saying this to disagree with the points JB and Robin have made, but rather to strengthen their argument that these trends have significant implications for governance and law and to reinforce that engaging now in anticipatory adaptation is the best chance we have of avoiding a breakdown in democratic governance. governance. Anticipatory adaptation is smart government and it's also smart business. The real question, and I was thrilled to see the toolkit that you have in, in your paper. The real question is, how do you do it? Given their focus on four degrees centigrade, uh, JB and Robin recommend reorienting adaptation policy for anticipatory redesign away from uh, incremental adaptation that is carried out largely at local and state levels, local and state scales, for one that is more regional and national. And I agree. I would suggest to you, as a bit of optimism here and opportunity, I would suggest to you that this reorientation is already beginning. I'm pleased to say that many of the items in their toolbox for redesigning adaptation are already being implemented in the United States by the federal government, by federal agencies like EPA, and by the private sector, the insurance industry, for example. President Biden's executive order on tackling the climate crisis, which he signed the first week he was in office, as well as landmark legislation like the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and the Infl Inflation Reduction Act, put these mechanisms at the national and regional level in motion. We've just started, there's still a lot to do, but it's happening. For example, J 
JB and Robin highlight the value of letting the market direct investments in adaptation in the right ways. We've already been seeing that happen. Again, reflecting off of your example of extreme events, NOAA has reported, as, as you just heard from Carlos, that since 1980, not just Dallas, but the whole US has incurred over $1.5 trillion in damages from weather and climate disasters, each of which cost at least $1 billion. So that's an underestimate. What's, what's so telling about that? Well, the economic impacts have become so severe at this point that the vulnerability of local communities to future impacts is now influencing credit ratings for municipal bonds. And I got to tell you, cities care about that. Yeah. And trust me, the markets care. JB and Robin also argue that planning and prodding by the federal government to guide private actors to make climate smart decisions and investments is critically important. Important, And I agree. They note, for example, that there is considerable, considerable agreement that the US's basic infrastructure already warrants increased investments. That is why the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act of 2022 provides billions, billions of dollars for federal agencies like EPA to provide resources to states, tribes, and local communities to invest in infrastructure with a concurrent focus on advancing environmental justice. And I wanna tell you that a huge, and people aren't aware of this yet, but a huge focus is being play, placed by all federal agencies on ensuring these investments lead to outcomes that are resilient to the impacts of climate change. For example, at EPA, which received $50 billion from the, uh, uh, from the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, criteria are now being integrated and included to incentivize climate adaptation in the various financial mechanisms we have for distributing those funds. But we're not starting there. We're also providing the technical support to the recipients of those funds to empower them and help them make climate smart investments. It's not just enough to write checks, but I gotta tell you what we hear from middle to smaller sized communities and tribes is we need the technical support to understand how to make climate smart investments. Very quickly, JB and Robin also emphasize the need for investment in research to better inform adaptation decisions and to provide the necessary tools that we hear from communities that they need. And in fact, the US Global Change Research Program is doing that, producing things like the national climate assessments that in fact are required under the Global Change Research Act of 1990 in order to provide timely and useful information to support decision-making. By the way, the evolution of that research program towards providing useful information in a timely fashion for decision-makers represents an evolution of the uh, Global Change Research Program. In addition to them, many federal agencies like EPA, NOAA, DOE, and DOT are making significant investments to produce the tools and technical support and information needed by decision makers in the public and private sectors across the nation. If I could just take a couple more minutes. Uh, Robin and JP also discussed the need to create a national foresight system for adaptation planning and to show you, as, as has been suggested, how quickly things are happening now. Just last week, the Office of Science and Technology Policy released a report outlining the development of a data-driven climate services system by the federal government, a coordinated federal government, that will provide the types of services a national foresight system needs to provide. We're just starting, and it isn't gonna be easy, but we are moving in that direction. And finally, Robin and JB talk about the need to develop programs that create paying jobs and provide training and adaptation skills. And again, that is already underway across the federal government. For example, agencies like EPA and DOT are already developing and providing training for people and communities across the nation to increase their awareness of why climate adaptation even matters for the things that they care about on a day-to-day -day basis, and then to train them on the implementation of adaptation strategies. So to conclude, 
I, I have to say, I shared JP and Robin's concerns about the um, increasingly scary risks posed by climate change and for the importance of having concurrent governance efforts to both mitigate greenhouse gas emissions and adapt to climate change. Let me, let me just quickly interject. I work on the adaptation side. So much, Davey, of what you said about our experiences, which mm -hmm. mirror each other from 10 years ago, 20 years ago, mm -hmm. 30 years ago, where adaptation was a dirty word. Mm -hmm. It was viewed as a diversion from mitigation. We live in a different world now, thankfully, and it's still evolving. But let me be clear, any smart climate change policy must consist of both mitigation and adaptation. They need to go hand in hand. And I would simply argue uh, in conclusion that whether or not we feel a need to prepare the nation for a path to a four degree world or beyond, we can and are already taking significant steps to develop a robust national foresight system for climate adaptation. And we need to continue doing so, and we need to do it fast with that old style. I just wanna point out before we move on that, that being a Nobel laureate qualifies you for two extra minutes. I'm <laughs> being generous, so it was three extra minutes. Okay. <laughs> And I love a panelist who actually starts with stuff. <laughs> uh, no, I, and, and thank you also, because I think for so many of us who work on these issues, it's easy to despair. And uh, thank you for pointing out that there is some momentum uh, going uh, at the federal level. So uh, thank you for those comments. I want to just take one second and remind the webinar participants to look in the chat. There are instructions for how to uh, switch your screen so that you will be seeing the speakers not just these slides. So we have over 150 participants, including people around the world as far away as Nepal. So we're yeah, we really glad to have you here. Nepal. <laughs> um, so uh, we're going to hand it over now to Rod Schunover. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for uh, the invitation to the organizers. Thanks to the panelists. Um, I read uh, this article with great interest. I read the full Minnesota version as well. I thought it was uh, very intriguing. And uh, coming to this uh, topic uh, as a scientist, as a complex systems physicist, and also as someone who worked in the security community for quite some time, including at the State Department, as uh, the Paris Agreement was being uh, constructed, um, I, uh, I tend to be an optimist on uh, many things regarding climate change. Um, however, I'm going to really lean into doom. Uh, <laughs> um, because what we're really talking about and, and the title of the paper that I offered up is really the dangers of underscoping risk. Um, no. Because what we're really talking about is risk assessment in many of these categories. And, uh, so basically, uh, institutions and models that uh, don't evolve in step with changing conditions cause problems. Uh, they either uh, don't, um, you know, they no longer serve the institutions or people uh, that are, um, you know, that they're in line to serve, and, and at times they can actually be part of the problem. And so I saw this in the national security community. Uh, when I saw a lot of resources, the doctrine and architecture becoming increasingly misaligned with the reality of the planet on which we um, on which we live. And I, I think, um, you know, in terms of the conclusions that uh, JB and Robin come to in the, in the paper, uh, I think they arrived in sort of the same place that um, especially in light of uh, cascading uh, change, tipping points. Um, I think they argue effectively that the uh, that governance measures uh, will fall short if institutions don't adapt and embrace. We've already talked about it. There, it's the real possibility of two degrees Celsius. Um, a lot of people, when you close the door in the scientific scientific community and the security community will say two degrees has long been conservative. Uh, it's one thing to talk about it as something, as a target for the multinational, multilateral institutions to aim for. 
it's another thing to as a target uh, for how we structure our society. And so the world that I'm uh, most recently a part of, the security community, uh, is quite pragmatic, quite realistic. Um, and they want to uh, focus their attention on realistic targets. Um, and so you know, the, I think the authors are keenly aware that discussions at four degrees Celsius bring out criticism of uh, being doomless. Um, I, I think some critiques that I think uh, I think sometimes that critique is fair um, when we are trying to communicate to the public uh, about um, about uh, temperature targets. But it, as I said, it's clearly long been too conservative for uh, adaptation uh, planning. Um, in the IPCC report, I'm going to pull out another. Um, um, quote, and that's uh, all pathways that limit warming to two degrees Celsius involve rapid and deep, and in most cases, immediate greenhouse gas emissions uh, in all sectors this de decade. And th those emission reductions are happening. Um, but, uh, you know, in physics, we talk about vectors. We have to have speed and direction. We have the direction. We don't have the speed. Uh, and, you know, I, I don't, the flip side of that, uh, that statement is what happens if we don't have transformative change? Because I see incremental change. I see a lot of it and it's good, but it's not transformative. And, um, you know, unfortunately in the United States, we also have a political system uh, in which two parties don't agree on the problem nor the solutions. Uh, and so it's hard to separate the scientific technological piece from that real fact. Um, the, um, uh, I think it's uh, you know, any intended planning uh, that's predicated on assessing the risk of a certain target, um, especially when it's um, something like two degrees, um, the, the danger of lowballing the risk uh, is, is high. Uh, so we don't do this in our normal life. If we have a, a, you know, a career changing meeting, uh, you know, somewhere downtown, especially somewhere we don't know, we don't try to time it exactly. We build a cushion. And because this is, so planning for two degrees Celsius is bad policy from a, for adaptation. And so um, I, I, I think that's, um, Something that the military does builds, you know, it, it assesses not the worst case possible, but a bad one, and and uses that in terms of uh, many of its risk assessments. I think a highlight of the article was the invocation of um, and really extension of the anticipatory governance. Um, uh, concept. I think it's even in times of relative stability, it's a good idea uh, to identify risks in advance while, rather than being hit by them and trying to respond. Right? Reactivity never leads to good outcomes or not optimal outcomes. It often leads to maladaptive, maladaptive uh, responses and outcomes. Um, I really like the author's use of redesign uh, in the discussion, especially the focus on sociological societal uh, pieces of our of, of resilience. And I could talk a lot more about the strengths of the paper, but I want some critiques. <laughs> I want to critique the paper a bit, um, if I might. Um, they call for the development of enhanced foresight capabilities. This is a part of the intelligence community I worked on for quite some time. Uh, and this is greatly needed, there's no question. Uh, we should temper our foresight uh, expectations since the systems we're looking at, as, as they often uh, are, in many ways are unforecasting. And more data doesn't get you more foresight. Uh, um, and that's not to say we shouldn't bound the problem. Uh, but we should uh, temper our expectations. Um, 
as someone who worked on infectious disease and pandemic risk planning, um, foresight, you know, for the, you, the authors bring up uh, COVID uh, um, and, and argue maybe if we had a pro appropriate foresight, we might have had a better response. Um, counter argument is we had foresight uh, in SARS-1, MERS, uh, you know, a number of other. In fact, I myself wrote in the an annual threat assessment the word coronavirus as a threat uh, three years before uh, it happened, uh, this, this latest coron coronavirus. So uh, foresight in itself, and again, the authors say this, isn't enough. You also have to make the decisions on that foresight. Uh, and so oftentimes we don't put enough effort into uh, enhancing decision-making, right? All the warnings in the world aren't going to help unless you actually get uh, that decision part. Um, the, I, I think probably for me, the most problematic uh, um, part of the paper, and it's actually the part that is the most interesting is the title and the thesis behind it, the four degrees Celsius. And it's not because it's too doomy, it's because uh, when you attach uh, the danger of a moment onto a temperature, you're actually missing other really, really incredibly important um, uh, thresholds, right? This is nothing that the authors don't know already. And I really like the treatment of tipping points uh, in, the, in the article. But the systems that the climate community models in their, in their Earth system models don't contain many of the things that are happening. They don't really take on um, the, the dangers of soil toxification, right? Or most of deforestation or, uh, you know, a lot of the things that have happened in the other planetary boundaries that are not climate change that uh, greatly affect the vulnerability of human systems to climate change. And so uh, a lot of the things that, uh, the tipping points that temperature uh, can push us over, they can also be pushed over by other things that are happening, right? Nitrogen and phosphorus uh, overabundance, for example. And so uh, four degrees Celsius, provocative, I, I, uh, I, I, I like it as a title, but we're in danger of passing a lot of these tipping points at two degrees Celsius. And so let's not think that there's a fault. I mean, intellectually, we can talk about four degrees Celsius as long as we internalize, we're in a lot of danger, uh, well below four degrees Celsius. And then uh, lastly, I would say, you know, the politics of the moment are important um, in terms of, uh, you know, and this is not a critique, of the uh, article, it's a contextual, contextualizing comment. Uh, we have a public uh, in which uh, that that is, uh, to me, seems to me to be quite vulnerable to influence campaigns of all stripes, both foreign and domestic, uh, of which uh, creates enormous challenges to governance. Uh, it's uh, it's hard for me to see a trajectory where the population of the United States, where we sit now, moves to a place where anticipatory governance uh, is not um, seen as a very unwelcome, maybe highly intrusive uh, um, set of activities by either the government or, uh, or industry. Um, I mean, I, uh, it's it's clearly the right thing to do, but I worry that we're underscoping the risks of doing that as well. That's it. Well, thank you. And um, right, that was very sobering, but um, mm -hmm. also very very thoughtful. Uh, thank you for those comments. Um, Hana, you're up next. Um, I will uh, like clean up here a little bit. I um, am also going to bring us a little bit back into the doom era, but as a practicing attorney, 
I also am going to kind of refocus us on the legal questions here. Um, these have been really excellent and informative presentations and discussions. Uh, also, it's it's rare that I get to sit on a panel with both a, a sage hen and a fellow Texan. <laughs> and as an environmental lawyer, it's really cool that my undergrad uh, mascot is a sage hen. <laughs> but um, but I have to admit, I uh, felt an increasing amount of dread reading this piece. Um, but it wasn't. Be it's not because of the thoughtful explanation for why we should both recognize and plan for the possibility of a world that doesn't meet its current climate goals. It goes beyond two degrees uh, and potentially up to four. You know, as we've heard with great eloquence, the communi communities in our country are already facing these risks. They're already facing these impacts and struggling with what what it means for their cities, for their communities, where they're going to go. Um, but rather it, it, that, that dread came because as lawyers are prone to do, I began to think about the legal mechanisms needed to achieve these goals of redesign adaptation as the piece walked through the ideas, uh, their ideas for needed future action. This wave of pessimism and dread came over me because I could not read the article without thinking about the current legal and jurisprudential trends that would impede even the earliest steps the authors have suggested. Uh, you know, as we've heard the and the authors know in in good detail, you know, our current approach to adaptation emphasized in in situ approaches and the three R's. Much of that legal authority for adaptive uh, action sits with the local and state jurisdictions right now. Um, you know, and they face competing incentives, as we've heard some of before uh, today. And you know, our problem are not well suited necessarily to be able to comprehensively plan for these larger changes. Each of the redesign typologies discussed many uh, and many of the examples of potential actions needed will require the federal government to do big things. And, you know, in ways that they haven't done before, uh, you know, I, I appreciate the, the references back to prior, prior examples, but there are, are big distinctions between those and, and what's happening now and, and our current environment. And using laws developed often without the foresight of for those needs. And ideally, Congress would act to address some of these shortcomings. But you know, we're facing significant headwinds there. This has been alluded to already, and it also is discussed in the paper. So I don't want to uh, make this sound like like Jamie and Robin did not <laughs> did not um, did not think about this. Um, we're in the midst of an historic assault on federal authority to address hard problems and particularly those designed to address climate change. This movement is the culmination of decades of work to clamp down on federal regulatory action in the courts, developing newly restrictive legal theories that, they're, that we're now seeing put into action. And aided by a re reactionary political environment that we just discussed a little bit of, um, that limits the potential for congressional action and has spurred a rise in politically mo motivated legal responses to federal efforts to address climate change. You know, even the author's proposal on the, the two degree uh, foresight program seems relatively modest compared to the potential changes we will need to address, uh, take further down the line once we enter these encounter these cascades of change. But even that seems is fraught in the current political and legal environment. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, JB and Robin are not blind to these issues and they make a point of acknowledging them. They are somewhat optimistic that, that some of these roadblocks will be overcome as the realities of what we face become more widely apparent. And to some extent, I agree, political headwinds uh, can shift quickly and stronger congressional action may once again be a reality. However, I believe the more intractable, intractable problem is that of interpretation of existing laws and the reimagining of the scope of actions the federal government can take, whether in Congress or in the executive. Our bedrock environmental laws and broader administrative law are under attack by those who seek to significantly undermine the ability of the federal government to regulate and act in technical areas that require expertise and longer term thinking, like climate change. The laws in the books today could be used to inch us towards the necessary redesign, and there's a lot of action going on at the federal level to try to do that, but they are currently being reinterpreted to limit the available act action in the tool in the toolbox the federal government has. Like legal theories being used to undercut executive action, the le these legal theories being used to undercut executive action can also impede congressional action. I don't think we need I think we need to recognize the potential for how this how this can play out. Um, 
these new legal, legal doctrines, you know, such as the major questions doctrine could significantly alter the ways in which Congress can, can legislate to allow for agencies to effectively implement the goals of the statute. Um, in order to have any hope of being able to address the problems identified in the paper, should we exceed two degrees and move towards four, we must, must counter this legal takeover designed to hamstring the administrative state and governmental action. And you know, doing so, I think, will require more than the national foresight system at this moment. That's an incredibly important piece of it in whatever form it takes. Um, but I think it requires a concurrent, dedicated effort to counter this, this legal movement, this dom currently dominant legal movement that would make adopted governance harder, if not impossible. You know, essentially, I'm, I'm trying to put a call to action out here to all the lawyers in the room mm -hmm. and law students, because, you know, we are, we are uh, talking about a legal journal and legal, legal implications here. And, and I don't want to be overly pessimistic. We've already heard about significant congressional and administrative actions that have been taking place in the last couple of years. Um, they are bread and butter with what I do for what I do. I focus on federal federal regulation and its implementation and you know and ensuring that the courts uh, don't don't undercut that action. You know these incentives, some of the some of the incentives that uh, are are being put into place through the Inflation Reduction Act and that came with the IIJA are, are part and parcel to to the just the ideas that were in in this paper. But their success remains an open question. There's wonderful work going on in parts of the federal government right now, uh, and but it's you know, they also have to work their way through the courts. The extent of the impact of recent court decisions on the ability of federal agencies to do their jobs or Congress to legislate in ways that allow them the flexibility to address hard and changing problems, the, you know, we don't fully know yet how that's going to come out. Um, there's a slew of challenges to agency actions that will make their way through the courts in the next couple of years. Some already are, are in that process at the moment, and these will define the scope of these limitations. So, you know, as someone who focuses on this and many other attorneys out there who do, I think we're at a critical moment where we have to make sure that we're ensuring these, these wonderful moves forward and steps forward have a place and continue to have a place in our governance. I wouldn't be able to do the work I do if I thought all was lost, I don't. Um, what are lawyers for if not hard problems, right? Um, and that, you know, so as someone focused on federal climate actions and how they fare in the courts, I see this as a call to action, identifying pathways to effective redesign adaptation and what that could look like in practice is incredibly important. And equally important is working to establish the legal precedent that will allow us to do so when we need to. And, you know, so reading this paper, I just had this like mm -hmm. big pull for urgency in moving that process forward alongside the kind of adaptive, uh, you know, thinking through the, the specific adaptive paths that we need to take. This requires a broader defense of the ability of the federal government to address climate change, pushing back in court on the current efforts to limit these actions, and creative legal thinking about what legal structures must change to accommodate redesign adaptation. So I'll just, you know, note my fi final comment is that I look forward to the next five papers. <laughs> uh, the ones that they alluded to in their papers that would outline more specific pathways to redefine adaptation, whether you're writing them or someone else, and work with uh, and to working with other dedicated lawyers, hopefully many in the room, uh, to analyze these legal avenues and reforms needed to achieve it. I, I think I, I'll just finish with saying that JB and Robin, you have achieved your goal of you know, getting the legal world's imaginative juices flowing and thinking about what this could look like. Um, you know, adaptation is a different problem than mitigation. I'm from Houston. <laughs> Houston has a lot of adaptation problems <laughs> uh, as, as the Gulf Coast uh, and many other places in our country. So I, I wanna thank you for this and let, you know, look forward to what comes next. And to thank you for that perspective. So you two have been sitting patiently listening to all these comments on your work. Do you want to take five minutes or so and, and respond? And then we'll go to some questions and answers and reminding the webinar participants that they can put questions in the Q&A box. Yeah, good. I've got several. First of all, this is fantastically thoughtful and 
helpful comments on just this is what makes LPAR so great. Uh, and it's such an honor to have our paper uh, available uh, for this kind of uh, conversation. Uh, just quickly, so uh, Carlos, uh, you, you've identified, I think, the real problem and challenge, but also why we need a national redesign of thinking is <laughs> that, you know, there are going to be inbound cities and outbound cities uh, or areas, right? And both need to plan. And just saying, you know, hey, we're going to be a, looking pretty good in Buffalo in 50 years. Come on. <laughs> Do you really want millions of people showing up in Buffalo's? Whereas and we're talking tens of millions. The Hauer study, what we cite in the paper uh, just from a few years ago, just looks at uh, sea level rise as a, as a force of migratory decisions. That's 11 million people they project moving away from the coast. And that's not taking into account heat, drought, wildfire, other other drivers of migration. So we're looking at tens of millions of people in the next maybe 25, 30 years moving around. And that that can't just be chaotic, random. That, that We need a plan for that. So that's the motivation. And I think it's super hard for uh, an outbound city to think that way. Uh, but at least uh, this foresight agency would give that city the basis for planning ahead and understanding that well, may, we may be losing population, but we, you know, how do we deal with that? But yes, I think that's important. The, um, uh, Joel, uh, I'm very encouraged to hear about these developments. What I have to realize is uh, we actually finished writing the Minnesota Law Review paper in February, 2021, two years mm -hmm. ago. Uh, a lot has happened. Uh, I don't think it changes the fundamentals of the paper or the thesis. But it's great on the one hand to hear about what's happening. And yet, as Hannah points out, it's also some developments that are, you know, making it more difficult to think and implement creative uh, uh, policies. Uh, Rod, I love your, uh, I'd love to talk to you later about complex systems. It's a big research area of mine, but uh, uh, both you and Hannah focus on this political reality. We <clears throat> anticipated that. <laughs> Uh, in our uh, proposal for anticipatory governance. And that's very much why we deliberately limited our really concrete proposal to a science-based agency, kind of a USGS style non-policy, but providing the beginnings of really robust scenarios, uh, taking into account that there's no real way to predict a complex adaptive system like this, a global complex adaptive system, should be advanced. But, but that science-based agency, maybe we could get that in without, you know, major questions doctrine or big political divisions and get a start on anticipatory governance. Uh, that would then provide the platform for that political moment. I mean, they happen. The IRA, you know, four years ago, you'd said we're going to have this huge spending bill. And so, well, that's never going to happen. We took advantage of the political moment and we've got to get ready for that next political moment that might allow us to then implement a more concrete substitute and just for governance at that national level. So fantastic comments. Yeah, I, I echo JB saying so comments were fantastic, came from a lot of different directions. Uh, but um, we, we did uh, uh, definitely recognize both politics and the law were going to be problematic. So um, I, I will let JB have the individual responses. I just wanted to, to take a, a couple of minutes to throw out some more general responses and where I take hope for, in all of this. Um, so um, I think Carlos, most responsive, responsive to you, one possibility of seriously thinking about a four degree C future or worse is you get serious about the mitigation. Mm -hmm. And, and that's one one way that these two uh, the decoupling might in fact come back and reinforce efforts on on the mitigation front is if you if you really think about this feature and JB and I both had days when we had to walk away from this paper for a couple hours <laughs> and just you know uh, digest uh, but if you really really think about it. It's hard not to get serious about <laughs> taking probably, mitigation seriously. Probably, can I just add one point on that? Because I, I totally agree with you. And one of the reasons I think people early on were pushing back on thinking about adaptation is consistent with some of the research that we've done with social scientists that if people just hear about adaptation and think it means the solution, then they become less supportive of mitigation. So it's so important to talk about adaptation in combination with mitigation. I think your point is essential there. Right. So, um, 
And then the, the, the last point I'll just leave with on a, a sense of hope, um, and this goes to the legal part, it goes to the politics part, it goes to why we want to be primed to, to do the right thing when the next moment comes, is, you know, in the background of all this, we are poised, and in my humble opinion, overdue for a generational shift in who's in government. Um, and I'm saying that very carefully, but I mean, it, it hasn't transitioned the way government has normally transitioned. And when I look at my students, when I look at the people in our children, the kids in our children's trust, uh, what they are accomplishing uh, in Europe, uh, what they are trying to accomplish in the United States, if you read uh, the district court opinion in the Giuliana case, if you read the dissent in the Giuliana case, there are judges who get it, and there's a generation that's about to take over that gets it, and the sooner they come into power, the better off we're all going to be. So uh, that's that's where I take a lot of hope, and, and that's where I see that moment coming, is we're, like I said, we're about to have a profound generational shift in governance, and it's going to skip a couple of gen. It's going to skip me, um, but that's fine. Uh, but, um, you know, I think that that's a, there's a lot, lot to be ready for anticipating that. And the more, uh, the more we've thought it through, the more that we have this foresight that can say, okay, you're ready here. Here's what you need to think about. Uh, I think it, there, there's room to be hopeful there. So. Chris, you want to pose the first question to uh, the panel? Yeah. yeah. And then we'll go to the audience. Uh, so, uh, professors, um, as Hanna Viscara mentioned, uh, with the administrative state's scope uh, significantly curtailed by precedent like West Virginia v. EPA, and uh, with congressional gridlock rendering um, most decisive legislative action uh, difficult, although we did hear about some progress uh, on that front, um, how would your proposed um, new National Foresight Bureau reliably sort of ensure that all of this um, this data is translated into actual action sort of at the state and local levels. Uh, we heard about sort of new uh, advances mostly in the Inflation Reduction Act and in the infrastructure bill. A lot of that seems limited to these sort of subsidy programs, these sort of beneficiary pays uh, programs, which seem to be the only things that are getting through Congress right now. Um, is that sort of enough to implement that, or you know, what's what are the options going forward to prevent the, the sort of underscoping of risk and to address the the, the fundamental um, change that we need that uh, Dr. Skunuper addressed? I'll just start by saying, if there is no political will, there's no political will. Um, and emphasize again the the point of our recommendation is to have. The information ready to go when when there is political will to put it in place. Uh, but that said, um, again, we do see change when major events happen, and as this becomes more and more of reality, um, it, you know, I'm at the end of the Colorado River. If you don't think that's not a daily discussion in Los Angeles uh, about what that means for the future of Los Angeles, uh, it, it really is. And and um, you know, Phoenix has gotten re record days where planes can't take off or land because it's too hot. Mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, the, those kinds of things, when they start, we're, we're having a really weird winter this year. I mean, how many weird winters do you have to say before it's like, okay, weird is going to be normal. Um, uh, but, you know, eventually people do have to respond. And we, um, you know, on the administrative law front, JP and I made this point in a different article we wrote together. Uh, we made up administrative law the first time. We can make it up again to make it do what we uh, needed to do. It's not, you know, uh, it's not written on tablets and, and can't be changed. Law is a human institution. It serves human ends. 
Uh, and when we needed to change, we have been more than willing to change it. So, yeah. uh, um, and like I said, that's just a matter of getting everything lined up so that when the political moment is there, it can get done. You know, I'm going to give a chance for any of the panelists. This is an incredible panel. Does anyone want to just follow up on anything they heard from other panelists um, or responses from the authors? And then we'll, we'll go to a question. I guess, I guess I'll speak to focusing on like seriously getting to mitigation and adaptation. I don't know if that means because we're just trying to do both, um, but so is the whole country with an IRA, that's a good start, but we need a whole bunch of money on both sides. And we haven't even really talked about equity. Like how do you, how do you really focus on equity in the right way? Um, you know, does that mean, you know, the city of Dallas, gets favored now versus other cities uh, in on the Gulf Coast uh, who are we, are we choosing winners and losers with the federal fund now uh, so so that in 20 to 30 years the cities of Dallas could be more resilient uh, and, and accept um, you know the the domestic migrants I mean that's a tough political mm -hmm. call. So, you know, there's yeah. an interesting comment um, from a webinar participant that says, I feel the mantra should be climate change adaptation, mitigation, and resilience. The resilience planning and policy and governance is advancing farther and faster than the first two. Any, yeah, Rod. Yeah, uh, real quick, uh, just in terms of the, um, the politics of the moment, I actually think it's unfair to saddle, you know, the authors in the paper on that particular piece. Uh, because that is uh, somewhat out of the, the control of, you know, in, there's a different force going on here. But I do think it's important to identify two things. And one is when you assess risk and when you scope risk, that information itself uh, as, as an element of risk, uh, which the intelligence community that I was a part of uh, had a hell of a time dealing with uh, in the uh, 2000s, but it is an, a significant piece uh, of governance. It's a significant piece of risk, uh, and we, our legal structures. Uh, I'm I'm a lowly physicist, so I, I hesitate to talk about uh, legal structures. But it seems like we don't have many levers at all uh, to uh, to address the information integrity question. And second, it's about scoping risk in the National Foresight Bureau, um, which, you know, I had, when I was inside of government, I argued for such capabilities that were domestically focused. Um, I think one thing that we have to be very uh, um, thoughtful about is how we scope risk there as well. And historically, the way that we talk about the uh, impacts of climate change and if you just start rattle off the things uh, that, you know, storms, heat waves, sea level rise, are you actually capturing the risk of climate change when you go through an especially abiotic uh, meteorological list of stressors? When the temperature of the planet is changing, it's no longer an environmental issue. This is a planetary control issue, right? Anything that's temperature dependent has the ability to be moved, right? And that's every chemical, biological, ecological, industrial, agricultural process. It's, it, it moves beyond weather, right? And so it might be that the most important stresses that come about from climate change are infectious disease patterns and uh, antibiotic resistance. Uh, and uh, crop production, right? And so, you know, historically, many communities have started with sea level rise and, and storms, but we know a lot more than we used to, and we can assess risk a lot better than we used to. There was a paper just shortly, there was a paper uh, that came out two years ago in Nature Climate Change, where the authors uh, identified 467 pathways by which climate change affects people. Right. And so when we look at a few of those, we're not seeing the entire story. I do, uh, um, I do think on the legal and political question, I think it's important to, to some extent, decouple those. 
you know, Robin talked about new generations and, and you know, very motivated folks looking at this in a different way. You know, political will can shift relatively quickly. Um, and even, even with, you know, the, the realities of where administrative law came from and where it could go, uh, I think we're in a moment where we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that we're in a moment where decisions being made now in legal jurisprudence can significantly slow down these potential, uh, these potential, you know, adaptive governance approaches. And so, you know, I view that as a real call to action for lawyers to make sure that they're engaged with these fights, that we're limiting the damage there so that we can quickly move forward when necessary. Um, because, you know, even, at, even if the political movement is headed one way, that may be different than the current such moment, um, you will still have these legal decisions on the books, judges in place that are following them, and that will outlast the broader political structure and, and feeling. And so we have to, we have to grapple with it. Uh, we have to limit the, the impact to the extent we can uh, and figure out new ways to address the legal issues and work with Congress to do so when necessary. So I, I, I just want to sort of emphasize that I see those as two sort of parallel structures, also parallel, also sort of separate from the, the identif identification of the, the need and the problem sets, which, you know, is incredibly important as lawyers, not physicists, not, you know, scientists. Yeah. We need somebody else to tell us what those are <laughs> so that we can start thinking about those legal structures and how we address them. Yeah. So while we're on that track, let me put a third uh, pathway on the table which is you know, the Environmental Defense Fund thinks about private governance as proof of concept. And one thought, you all did a really nice job, I think, of noting that possibility and then saying you're gonna dive into public. One thought would be, we get Vanderbilt, we get USC, maybe we get a major foundation, and we start actually building the organization and the plan that you're talking about for the time when the political system is ready to bring it in so that we have something up and running that can begin to do what you're talking about. And let me just say that lastly, I've been working with physicists for 20 years in the academy. I've never heard one put the word lowly before physicists. <laughs> just want to say we've got a remarkable panel here, remarkably modest given their talents. We do, and I, I, I think we needed another hour, clearly, but we need to wrap up. So what I'm going to suggest, uh, because the people in the room did not get to ask questions, if you all wouldn't mind hanging out, maybe in that corner for the next five 10 minutes and answering questions. Uh, we'll set this up uh, while you guys are, are doing that. Uh, we'd appreciate it. So we're going to take a 10 minute break. We're going to get back on time because of our <laughs> webinar is in process. <laughs> So, uh, webinar participants, the feed is live uh, throughout. We can't turn it off, so you may want to mute your uh, sound for the next 10 minutes and uh, turn it back on when we start. <laughs> Looking forward to being back. Yes, yeah. sir. He's the winner. He's, yeah. <laughs> He's a good man. Oh, my particular. I thought there was a lot of discussion. The kind of
That's uh that's part of the syllable, and I was going to try and put it in your hands. Fantastic! I had a chat GPT write some comments for me. That's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually good because the, the last week or two, I've been like everything that I was thinking. Like I know you're I like know. rendered irrelevant as humans and everything. I've been thinking because they're so it's funny. Yeah. I mean, we're not. We're not. But it's full of chat GPT. Okay, you guys are getting off, okay? We're good? All right. Welcome back. Keep finished. Nice to meet you. All right, everyone, welcome back. I'm Linda Bragan. I'm with the Environmental Law Institute. For those of you who are just joining us on the webinar or here in person, and we are going to um, get started, um, but I want to remind the webinar uh, folks that you should put questions or problems about technology in the chat, and you should put your questions for the panel in the question box. And if you're having any trouble getting the screens to work, there are instructions in the chat because you should have your speakers front and center, not the placeholder screen as you're watching the webinar. So, um, we're going to go as fast as we can, and we may go a little bit over because we started a little bit late, and uh, I want to make sure we do have um, time for questions. So I want to start by introducing third-year law student Tasia Harris, who is on remotely with us today. She was the article editor from Vanderbilt Law School for this article, and I am going to hand it over to Tasia to introduce our panel. Thanks, Professor Brigan. Um, as 
Professor Bregan has said, my name is Tasia Harris and I'm a third year law student and LPART article editor. I'm excited to facilitate this panel discussion of the article, How Algorithm Assisted Decision-Making is Influencing Environmental Law and Climate Adaptation by Sonia Jaya. Sonia Jaya is an assistant professor at the University of Baltimore School of Law and external research, research affiliate of the Environment and Democracy Group of Central European University's Democracy Institute. Jaya's research interests focus on the overlapping areas of environmental governance, environmental law, technology, and society, asking how environmental law and institutions can sustainably adjust to rapidly changing biogeophysical conditions and societal demands associated with climate change, and what the consequences are for equity and democratic participation. Her approach to these questions draws on her interdisciplinary background in geography, water policy and law, as well as her practical knowledge of energy regulation. Before University of Baltimore Law, she worked in energy regulation at the California Public Utilities Commission and was the research lead for the Water Energy Climate Nexus at the California Energy Commission. Jaya holds a PhD in geography from the University of Arizona, a Master of Science in Water Science Policy and Management from the University of Oxford, and a JD from UC Law, San Francisco. Joining Professor Jaya is panelist Keith Dennis, Senior Fellow at the US Department of Energy. Keith is an expert in energy and climate policy, NEPA, and international law. He has experience advising and litigating multi-billion dollar infrastructure projects, negotiating in dozens of international environmental agreements, including the Paris Climate Agreement, and developing net zero energy housing. Keith holds a JD from Georgetown University, an LLM from the London School of Economics and Political Science, and a BS in Communications from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. We are also joined by panelist Mohit Chabra, technical lead and advisor for climate and clean energy at the Natural Resources Defense Council. Mohit provides analysis and strategic guidance to policymakers and other stakeholders at the state, regional, and national levels. He is currently working on redesigning electricity pricing to facilitate decarbonization and enhance affordability, developing cost-effective pathways to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and pollution from California's energy sector, and serving as a technical advisor to other regional teams. He holds a master's in civil environmental and architectural engineering from the University of Colorado Boulder, and a bachelor's in mechanical engineering from the University of Pune in India. Lastly, we are joined by panelist Deborah Gorman, president and CEO of the Green Lining Institute. Deborah has over 25 years of leadership experience in nonprofit and private research universities, and over 10 years of private sector business development expertise, having worked in investment banking, international infrastructure development, and engineering. She currently serves on several advisory boards, including the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco Community Advisory Council as a 2023 chair, the California Organized Investment Network, which serves as a national model to provide leadership in increasing insurance industry investment in underserved rural communities throughout California, and the Nonprofit Insurance Alliance Board of Directors. Deborah received her BS in management Sciences and her MBA in finance from Stanford University. Thanks. Going back to Professor Brennan. Great. Thank you so much, Tatia, for being with us remotely. And we are going to kick it off. Sonia, tell us about your article. Great. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, there should be some slides, I think. Yep. Great. Otherwise, it'll be a really different presentation. <laughs> um, I want to first thank. Uh, the Environmental Law Institute and Vanderbilt. I'm so glad to be here to, to share my paper and I'm honored to be uh, among you panelists. So thank you so much. Um, so a lot's happened since I wrote this article and we'll get into that a little bit. I'll try to keep this pretty short. So next slide, please. Thank you. So the takeaway first uh, on the next slide is that algorithm, algorithmic tools are really just forum for environmental decision making. In the first panel, we talked a little bit, or rather the panelists talked a lot uh, about the kinds of tools that we need for climate adaptation. 
And we're thinking about those as kind of like, yeah, tools that they fit into democratic processes, and then there's kind of an output. What my paper is challenging is that idea that these are something separate. Uh, so I'll go through this argument. Next slide, please. So when we think about forum for decision making, we're used to thinking about like legislatures, maybe courts, if you're a lawyer, uh, and administrative agencies. But what you see at the bottom of this slide is a schematic uh, of an optimization model and how that views the water system in California. And I'm suggesting that this is also a forum where we can kind of start to open this up and understand it in a more uh, participatory way. Next slide, please. So why should you care about this? First, climate adaptation absolutely depends on these tools. Secondly, algorithmic tools embed value-laden assumptions and biases which influence climate adaptation and law. And the third reason is that the rules of this new kind of forum necessarily impede equity and democratic participation without deliberate countermeasures. Next slide. To the extent you can speak loudly for the background, the problem, no, and okay. I'm sorry, but it's, you know, one of these complicated hybrid things, but, you know, the microphone yeah. is going to the webinar feed, it's not amplifying right now, and All so right. to the extent you can, I don't Great, know. I'm going to try to treat you guys like one else in the room, Yeah. So my apologies if you can't totally hear me, but I will do my best. Thank awesome. you so much, Linda. <laughs> All right, so here's the forum argument. Uh, in practice, what these tools are doing is what legislatures, courts, and deliberative bodies do. So from political science, we know that politics is who gets what, when, and how, and it's also who decides and how we decide such things. So what these tools are doing are really allocating resources, right? These are mostly optimization models that I was looking at, but there's also other kinds as well, um, according to internal rules. So who gets what, when, and how. Next slide. So climate adaptation depends on these tools, as you this audience likely knows much more about than than you know broader audiences. Climatic patterns have diverged from the historical envelope, so we can't rely on the past as a predictor uh, of the future. Right. So here on this graph, you can see changes in global surface temperature from 1850 to 1900, uh, and then later on, uh, this is from the six assessment report, so it's a little bit dated. Next slide. Okay. These changes are obviously not evenly distributed. Next slide. Thank you, Tasia. Uh, changes in participation patterns also vary dramatically. Next slide, please. Why this is a problem is because when we developed our laws and where climate is going now. So if you look at this graph, you can see the major period of state water rights law in the United States all kind of happen when things were pretty stable, right? Rule curves for major U.S. dams, these are, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, set by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in order to decide how much water you can keep and when to release it. Those were set kind of in the 1950s, kind of mid-century, last century, uh, but things have moved on since then. Okay, next slide, please. That is an example of a rule curve. These are really important for dam operations. So this is for hydropower, for flood control, making sure that there's enough water for everybody. Obviously, this is something that is crucial uh, when you're talking about climate adaptation in terms of who's getting water and when. Uh, these were done with slide rules in the 50s <laughs> with very, very limited historical data. So if we're going to adapt to climate change, as discussed in the first panel, we need to change how we're thinking about some of these laws and planning. Next slide. All right, so climatic patterns have diverged, right? We talked about that. Algorithmic tools are what helps us because we cannot rely on the past. We need scenario development uh, and ways to interpret those scenarios. Next slide. Algorithmic tools, though, embed value-laden assumptions and biases which influence climate adaptation and law. So I want to pause from what's on this slide briefly to let you all know, like, I know that there's a lot going on with chat GPT and machine learning. <laughs> uh, and there's a lot that's been going on with, like, policing and how policing is using algorithmic tools and surveillance and how they're using it. A lot of that has to do with input data. That is a problem here, too. But I want to 
just remind everybody that machine learning is one kind of algorithm. A recipe for a cake is another kind of algorithm, right? Algorithms are just programs for what, what steps to take when, right? So, okay, here's how value-laden assumptions and biases kind of get baked in. So my article talks about three pathways. The first is uncertainty. So all engineers say this, all models are wrong, but some are useful. This is something that they know, right? But there's a process of simplification. Choices need to be made and those choices will drive the outcome of the model. Making those choices itself is value-laden. Secondly, transparency. Explanations might be insufficient, right? If we have something, again, going back to chat GPT, which I really shouldn't do, <laughs> but taking that as an example, if you know the company behind it said like, look, here's our code, here's everything that we did. There are very few people in this room and this room is packed with experts who would be able to understand that. Right, information doesn't necessarily mean that there's a capacity to understand it. Mm -hmm. Third, the characteristics of the network and the development process. So, you know, these are tools, just like law is a tool. So they're tools and they're forms. But who is involved in that process of the development and what role and when they have that role also uh, influences what kind of assumptions are made in uh in the program itself next slide all right so going back to this rule curve example so one of the uh the tools that i talked about in my article is this program called inform and inform is used to regulate reservoir operations across a, a river uh, and kind of combines a couple things and includes you know interesting climate scenarios and it turns out it does it a whole lot better than humans do when I spoke to uh, the developers of that program, one of the things that they said that they did was they went out and they interviewed existing dam operators. What they found out from existing dam operators is that they actually would diverge from what they're technically legally allowed to do. So they incorporated that, that divergence, right, that normal practice that people use and incorporated it into the model. But at this point, no one can remember, including uh, the developers of the model, what it was that people were doing that was different from what was on the books, right? So you're losing something in there through that translation. Next slide, please. All right. Finally, why should you care? So the rules of this forum impede equity and democratic participation without deliberate countermeasures. Here's what I mean by that. And our normal kinds of forums, right, when we're thinking about courts or city councils or legislatures, there's allocation, but it's with deliberation. It's publicly known and available rules. There's an informed network of actors in a language, albeit with jargon, and at times behind closed doors that is intelligible. So even though we might disagree with how those politics are playing out, it's all being done in a language that we know and can treat and can critique. And there's an entire world of experts, many of whom are sitting next to me, um, who understand that and can help translate it to the public. Next slide. <clears throat> Excuse me. So with algorithm assisted decision making, what we have is allocation, but with no public deliberation. There's a simplification which requires value laden assumptions to be made. It's difficult to access and to understand which makes it really difficult to review. Next slide, please. So energy, natural resources, and, and environmental decisions are already inherently technical. They're very difficult to understand. My mother is a very smart person. I try to explain to her <laughs> what I do. There's you know, only so much traction you can get there. There's a lot of expertise that's needed. Reliance on algorithmic tools makes these decisions even more opaque and difficult to access. Modeling function, model functioning and development necessarily embeds those kinds of biases and value-laden assumptions that we talked about. 
And the networks that develop those tools are highly technical, are highly educated technocrats, which I don't mean disparagingly. Those are, they form really important parts of society, but are not representative of society as a whole. Uh, next slide. Okay, so quickly to repeat myself, you should care because climate adaptation depends on these tools. They're embedding value-laden assumptions by the kind of nature of themselves. And then those rules might actually undermine legitimacy. Next slide. So what I do in my paper is to try to open this up and create at least as an initial step, a framework of questions that people who, who are in kind of advisory roles or who are kind of participating uh, in these processes can start to ask to open up these models to more democratic and equitable processes. So I divide this up into questions that have to do with the model itself and the design process, and it goes through uncertainty, transparency, and stakeholder collaboration. Next slide, please. But all of these basically come down to this, which is, is equity, whether it's substantive or procedural, included in the network for producing algorithmic tools? Next slide, please. So just to summarize the argument one more time, algorithmic tools are basically a fora, right? They're because they're making these kinds of allocation decisions and then humans tend to follow those, we should understand these in a very different way than we have been. You should care because really these aren't going away. We need them so much, just as uh, the first panel had mentioned. But because of the nature of them, we need to develop better systems for understanding them and to bring them back into line with, you know, what I think are still uh, democratic values, although that might be changing in the United States. Okay, mm -hmm. it may be possible to make equity considerations more apparent through the use of this framework, which considers the characteristics of both the tool and the development. Uh, so with that, Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to questions and discussion. And, th and thank you for treating us all like one else or people who do not like your mother, um, because I do think this is so important. The students can vouch for this. When we read this article, I was very excited because I hadn't in, in you know the decades I've been doing this, I really had never focused on this. And yet I focus a lot on public involvement and we have a lot of discussions about equity. And this is almost invisible. So thank you for writing the article and for explaining it to us in a way that at least I could understand and hopefully your mom. And uh, Keith, you want to jump in here? <clears throat> sure. Thank you. Um, so thank you, Professor, for the uh, for the article and for uh, the explanation. Now, I've, I've read the article several times, um, and I feel like this was still fantastic, like, like the sort of you know, curtains are falling away. And I'm like, oh, yeah. So, so additional so little epiphanies going on in particular, like um, your emphasis in the presentation of talking. Sorry. And then in, in my points, I just want to say, but like if anybody on the panel, if anybody in the audience here has any questions at any point, feel free to raise a hand, interject at any moment. Um, I'm more interested in responding to questions um than than just going through my points but i had a few main points to make which a new one was that uh i really uh, appreciated your emphasis on thinking of these algorithmic tools as as a forum for de for decision making mm -hmm. and we need to think about it in that way um and in thinking through that i, I did want to emphasize a few of the points that you made there um that that really stuck out to me as I read it through several times. And the first one was, you know, you talk about this, what what do I think at one point you asked the question, what algorithms have to do with it? And from my point of view, it's it's everything everywhere is sort of some sort of algorithmic based decision making, as you said, from like down to a recipe that we're doing, but also um, working in the Office of Policy at the Department of Energy, the our office is full of um, a lot of experts who are sort of straddling between the technical expertise and bringing it to the policy. So there are people that are my colleagues in the office who will be working with National Renewable Energy Laboratory, the experts at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, the sort of people with the supercomputers doing this modeling 
are then working with folks in our office who are both helping develop the models and also translating the results of them for sort of policy relevant things. And so for me, it feels like everything that I deal with every day is, is something that's coming in, going into or coming out of one of these big algorithms. But I do think that we also, as we're thinking about this, want to keep in mind all the other places where uh, we're engaging with or relying on algorithmic assisted decision making even outside of those formal channels of like where we're modeling something. Um, professor, you mentioned chat GPT several times and my apologies, <laughs> Ms. Setsu, but I, I did have chat GPT write some comments for me. And it, was, it was seven pages. It was okay. It was a little dry. Not much of a sense of humor in Chat GPT. But hey, but don't worry. We have Chat GPT responses. Oh, good. Um, yes, we'll do. Yeah, yeah, we'll, yeah. So they can talk about how dry it was. But they uh, and I will refer to this a couple of times because it is um, interesting. And I and I did have a little bit of that uh, sort of crisis of confidence in this last week of thinking every all of my observations are just it's all superseded by this thing that's out there now that everybody's talking about that this is. A uh, fantastically complex algorithmic model. When you stop and think about it, it's the sort of chat GPT and things like that that we're seeing in the news are one particular sort of you talked about the sort of machine learning is something people talk about with algorithmic models. It's only one element. Chat GPT and these large language models, they're just one kind of additional tool that we have. I like to think of going back uh, 10 or 15 years when IBM's Deep Blue first beat. Uh, master chess champion in the, Gary I forget, Kasparov. Gary Kasparov. Um, and, you know, in the headlines are then, you know, computers are taking over the sort of the computers, you know, can now beat our chess champions. Well, it turns out the thing that could reliably beat a computer playing chess is a person in a computer playing chess. And so that, that it is to keep in mind, even as these get more complicated, they are still tools for us to be used at least for a little while longer before they uh, before they take over completely, presumably. Um, but one thing, another thing to think about in terms of the algorithmic decision-making is in the research tools that we use and have used for a decade or more, that we may not think about how it's screening what we're receiving and the information we're getting. We think about sort of Facebook, um, you know, tick Twitter, the way those algorithms work to feed particular content to people. And there's been lots of writing about that, but even something is just your basic Google search and thinking about, am I actually getting a uh, sort of objective view of the research here? I had an experience again about 10 years ago where I was working on a project related to uh, the Keystone XL pipeline that was proposed to be built from the US to, uh, from Canada to the US. And I was trying to research something on a specific Oklahoma law about pipelines and I was using Google for it. And no matter what search terms I put in about Oklahoma Public Utilities Commission, I just would get 10 or 20 pages of Keystone XL pipeline stuff. And I finally figured out after about an hour of wasted time that I needed to log out, log into a different browser without being logged in and then did the search and it popped up the first time. And I thought, mm. oh, it's just this thing has learned mm. that it's, that this guy really likes this pipeline and just keep feeding him as much as he will get there and he'll click on it all. Um, so anyway, it's to be aware of all those different places where we're now being influenced in um what we're being fed, not just by the specific tools, but the other ways we get information. Um, one point relating to both, and I'm now see that I'm babbling too long, so I'm going to start going quickly. One point that I wanted to make related to both uncertainty and transparency that both highlights the difficulty in this area for an additional example, and was one of the ways that I thought a scientist best cut through that uncertainty for me previously. The first one is that in, you mentioned several other places where algorithmic assisted decision-making is being used perhaps more directly as just algorithmic decision-making, like what comes out of the model is just automatically doing something. Many states, um, and in particular, I know in Nebraska, my home state, the welfare benefits the agency has contracted out to a contractor that is using their algorithm that's just determining sending out benefits letters, benefit denial letters from, you know, it's, an this is not an insurance company doing it. This is the state bureaucracy doing it through this company. Um, I was talking a couple of years ago with an NGO in Nebraska who was very concerned about this, worried about the transparency of it. And they were working, you know, through the public information laws to try and get access to just what the code was, what the thing was. And they were running into problems with uh, the company saying it was proprietary. It's not subject to the public interest laws. So they were fighting that battle. But then they came and they were talking to me because they were like, okay, 
what if we actually get this stuff? Like we, we're, we're a bunch of public interest lawyers. Like how are we gonna make any sense of what's going on there? Um, and it just highlights that, and it, it, it is the, and of course my answer was, well, I can put you in touch with some data scientists who can help you figure <laughs> that out because I certainly can't do it either. But uh, one example where this has been best explained to me was in a previous life before I started working on climate issues. I did a lot of work on oceans uh, issues and living marine resources and working with um, scientists doing population models of fisheries. So you're trying to manage high seas fisheries, figuring out who can take how much fishing per year that will not impact the stock levels. And we were, you know, pressing our scientists and asking these questions and asking them what we should do in the negotiating positions until they finally like stopped and they were like, look, like, I can't tell you what the correct answer is. They're like, I can tell you based on these inputs that there's this percentage chance that this population won't crash in this year. And then as determining what percentage chances you want there, what level of risk you want to undertake, how protective you want to be of coastal communities versus uh, deep sea fishers, like that's, those are all political and policy decisions that you can use this information for, but this information does not give you the correct answer. Um, and that is the, the, which brings those still to even that information and the point that you make about the value laden assumptions that can go on in the algorithms, both in the input data, uh, which is a big issue in this, in this area also, because you think of, um, for citing new transmission lines, but we need uh, hundreds, if not thousands of miles of them to help decarbonize uh, is a key piece. Siting uh, pipelines, any linear inf infrastructure, the siting will be done by an algorithm that is going through and figuring out a least cost solution for the, for the developer. And it will do least cost solution. It will avoid, you know, it will have sensitive environmental areas. It will have, you know, heavily populated areas. So it's not just least cost, but then within all these things, it will chart out the least cost solution. So of course, the, the least cost solution based on the property prices to acquire these things will end up reflecting potential discriminatory practices that have gone on for decades in the past, such as redlining that was done by uh, the federal government going back into the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, up until still now, probably for private banks who are still base their loan decisions on these underlying assumptions about the communities, the people that live there, the value of those communities. When you take and do that as your input into this algorithm, it's going to be the least cost solution. It's also going to go to the most disadvantaged communities, the people less able, least, least able to represent themselves, the people with the least resources and most impacted already. Um, and then just to uh, give a slight, uh, I guess, the, the uplift, the, the good things that we can do with algorith algorithmic decision making is that uh, a project I worked on right before going back to the Department of Energy was working with a data science NGO, trying to identify where they could make a difference in the sort of environmental justice or energy justice issue. And one of the things that we started to uncover as we dug into it is that there are a variety of federal and state programs that will help people with uh, electricity bills for heating and cooling, federal programs that will help uh, fund people weatherizing their homes, which used to just be thought of in terms of uh, you know, surviving cold winters is increasingly important now. And we're seeing a shift in where these funds are needed to uh, a climate adaptation thing that in the warmer climates, people are needing better insulated homes because they're starting to feel that impact more in their energy bills. And one of the things that we're finding with the some of the study was done already and where we were directing this data science group to go is that usually these things were done on sort of the census block level, right? And the census block is that might be 600 to 3,000 people, 5,000 people in a census block. And that's sort of how fine scale the data could be. With using some machine learning and some advanced algorithmic decision making, people were doing additional studies, doing finer grained uh, information on both geographic uh, specificity and specificity from you know energy uses down to a household level. We're finding that the the energy burden was the gap in the energy burden, the sort of the energy efficiency for the poorest households versus the wealthiest households. Past studies doing this on a census block level thought there was about a 25% difference. Forest households are about 25% less efficient. When they started doing this at the more fine scale detail, 
they were finding things more like 27 to 167 percent less efficient mm -hmm. in energy use. And so it's both uncovering a deeper problem than we realized, also giving the tools to better target the relief to those who need it most. But coming to the participatory question then, though, is um, and what I would think the next big thing that would be helpful for policymakers coming from the academic of building on the areas that you identified there, particularly on that last piece of helping figure out the most effective ways to engage and uh, get input into the process from those most impacted, those most vulnerable, those with the least, of, the least, the least resources to be able to participate in the process. Um, will be a key part of helping use the algorithmic assisted decision making to um, both uncover the biases and correct them going forward. So thank you. I'm sorry if I went a few minutes over. No, no, you're good. You don't have a Nobel Prize, but we still gave you an extra minute. Or two. Thank you. Yeah, yeah someday. That's, someday that's an anticipatory on kind of move. Yeah. On our part. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be in medicine. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much for those, uh, those really thoughtful comments. Mohit, do you want to Go next. Sure. So I spend a fair amount of time working with lawyers, participating in decision making proceedings, and trying to help them make sense of the problem that Professor Jaya described. So, what I'm going to say now, and this is in my written comments too, really jumps, uses her paper as a starting point. And the sentence she said that just getting information and understanding. The process isn't enough. That's just a starting point. So what I grappled with was how do you empower advocates, stakeholders, technical and non-technical, to actually participate to be able to make a difference? You know, how do you go about thinking through that? I came up with a concept, um, could be better named, but I'm calling it building algorithmic intuition. <laughs> and I came up with a few questions that would help you start to get there. But before that, I think it's lost on no one that we are here because of what algorithms tell us and models tell us. Models tell us that global warming is happening, four degrees centigrade comes with a certain amount of devastation, and that's why we're here. So it really is, you can't get away from algorithmic uh, tools in decision-making and policy-making in this field. Right, that's the basis of why we're here. An example is California a few years ago passed Senate Bill 100, which is the first of its kind required zero carbon electricity by 2045. And I didn't see any proof of an algorithm deciding the date or how you get there. But once they decided that, the California Energy Commission, Public Utilities Commission were tasked of figuring out how to do that in the least cost manner. Uh, keeping all of environmental constraints. And of course, they used a bunch of complicated models to do that. Reason being that electricity travels at a reasonable fraction of the speed of light. What you do on one end of the grid impacts all of their ends. It's really hard to make these decisions without a tool. So, well, what is this algorithmic intuition thing? Um, so I broke it down in, into three questions. The first is understanding the scope of the problem at hand and the scope of the model, uh, key parameters, and causal relationships. So I'll take an example of what I consider one of the darker black boxes that I've come across recently, tell you what it is, and then apply this concept to it and show how you, know, you could possibly participate in it. So the issue is the social cost of carbon or the greenhouse gases. The EPA recently tried to update that number. Some of you may have heard of it. Um, basically, it's a economic estimate of future damages that carbon emissions cause. And it's important because when looking at regulation, it's one way to figure out how much money should be put on mitigating carbon. You know, we, put in that much money commensurate to the benefits, right? In simple terms. So what? how is it calculated? You start with surveying a lot of economists and policymakers to figure out future global gross domestic product for the next 300 years, you know, broken down by regions and associated carbon emissions. 
then you take that as your baseline and you use climate models to understand the impact of an additional gigaton of carbon emissions on this uh, you know, forecasted GDP. And there are many uncertainties and scenarios within that. Then you look at recent re research to figure out, well, what does that change in carbon emissions do in terms of temperature, sea level rise and such? And then you try to figure out what's the economic damage in productivity adaptation. And then you present value it to today, accounting for the economic conditions and your discount rate, how it would change based on how wealthy you are and how big of a disaster you think is coming up. This is with a lot of simplification. Uh, and they of course do this differently for different zones of the world. They value mortality differently in different countries and so on. So it's complex and I was, I had to write comments on it. And I spent maybe three hours every day for two months thinking about this. And also note that when the interagency working group under President Obama embarked on this, they said a median recommended value is $50 per ton. When pre former President Trump's um, administration did that, they said it's lower than $5. <laughs> and this EPA value is $185 a ton. So that speaks to what Professor said about value-laden assumptions and how they impact mm -hmm, outcomes. Mm -hmm. That's a very clear example. So let's apply this concept, starting with the scope. The first question is, should we account for damages only within our geographic borders in the US for US policy, or should this be global? Mm -hmm. Now that's a legal question and a policy question. But that very factor was one of the main determinants why the Trump administration came up with an under $5 value. So just that scope mm -hmm. question impacts your outcome significantly. And that's something all of you could reason through and participate in. The second is what inputs matter most and why. There was a really good study done in Nate, published in Nature that showed that what really matters most is the discount rate, how much you discount future damages, and also how much you value health, mortality impacts, and agricultural impacts. Therein, it's also apparent that this study doesn't value ecological damage. So that's another place where you could weigh in on that, wait, one of the biggest reasons why we're doing this is to abate ecological harm, but you aren't accounting for it. And now you know exactly what parameters, even if you can't solve or dig into studies that try to come up with a causal relationship between mortality and temperature, you know who to go to, to start advocating. And so I think in explaining that, I illustrated how the scope, key parameters, and understanding causal relationships starts to form a al certain algorithmic intuition. And not all of these would be apparent to a stakeholder. So I think it is the responsibility of model developers and people facilitating the process to be forthright about these three things. And one, I think you can all demand and ask for some of this information too. A technical way of um, determining causal relationships, once you have a list, hopefully from the developer, on what parameters matter the most is you take a model, hold all parameters constant, take the first key input, you double it, and then you half it. And then you go down the line. And that gives you a really good understanding of what pressures on what part of the model produce what outputs. So you can conceptually reason out how much of a difference would it make to my cause? Should I even participate in this? And if I do, what should I pay attention to? But in closing, and to prove that I'm at least 10% less dry than ChatGPT, I'll <laughs> rip off an example that my um, colleague just talked about, about uh, the chess master, Gary Kasparov, and the computer model. And Gary, our old friend, thought that he had an algorithmic intuition down. He knows chess really well, so he knew all the causal issues, what moves do what. Um, he knew the scope, which is that this computer is only looking at past data, right? And he knows all the key inputs and outputs. And 
I think from what I've read, and if that book is true, this match was headed for a draw, but then the a certain move was played that really confused Gary. And it was a non-computer move and it made no sense from an algorithmic point of view. Hmm. Really confused him, he ended up losing. Hmm. Turns out later that there was a bug <laughs> and the computer played an irrational move. And our friend's algorithmic intuition was thrown off, but if he'd stuck by this concept that I just thought up in the last two days, <laughs> he might have. That's oh, awesome. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. This is all becoming clearer and clearer to me with each commenter. Um, let me just mention a few people have referenced their written comments. Um, in case you weren't here in the beginning, what's going to happen is that all the articles you've heard about today that are very long articles with a lot of footnotes have been condensed by Vanderbilt Law students. They will be far shorter. And then our commenters are writing even shorter comments, all in the idea is to get this to practitioners and policymakers who are very busy and only have time to read shorter documents. It will be published in the August issue of Environmental Law Institute's Environmental Law Reporter as a joint Vanderbilt ELI publication, but we will also be posting the articles and comments on the website in the next couple of months. So that's the reference to written comments, but the articles, the original articles are available on SSRN, Social Science Research Network, and on the um, journal's webpage that originally published the article. So if you want to slog through the 800 footnotes or whatever it is, you can do that. So um, Deborah, you're going to wrap up the comments for us, right? Great, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. I'd be remiss if we did not acknowledge Caesar Shop this day today mm. and uh, labor rights. So let's just... Um, say that that's what's happening today. So mm -hmm. I'm with the Green Lighting Institute. We're located in Oakland, California. A little bit of bashing happening in California, but I'll share with you that California is the country on fast forward. Uh, we are we are doing things, some of the maps that we saw, we, we were doing some of those initiatives about 10 years ago. So it makes, I think, the country a little uncomfortable to look at what we're doing because we're so like leading edge, leading edge, failing fast. Uh, we are also, uh, you know, the fourth largest economy. Thank you, Germany, for dropping down. Uh, and so, so I think that gives us a little bit of gravitas and being able to talk about, um, you know, sort of climate change, economic equity. Uh, so Greenlighting Institute has been doing uh, both economic equity and climate equity. And we sit at that intersection um, for about 30 years now. And so when we were asked to uh, come in on Sonia's paper, we were happy to do so. We had a particular uh, perspective and I'm gonna get you up about 30 or 40,000 feet. And then you'll see how that will apply to uh, everything that was provided. Also, I, I love being on the end because I have uh, both the NRDC and EPA. These are not, these are, these guys fight a lot. Um, <laughs> so, but it's good to, <laughs> they're, they, they're, it's great. They bring a perspective to the, to the market. Um, and so what we um, what we have seen at Greenlining to, to really um, help set the frame here is just straight up algorithmic bias. So the context of which you heard here is what we are seeing being played out in both um, the economic landscape and what's happening in the economy and then in the environment. Um, and for us, if I can just center equity, right, it's not equality. Um, I like that we're positioned between the four degrees and what's coming up. I think the ESG is coming up. Uh, equity is not ESG and it's not DEI. Equity is recognizing um, that we start at different places and that there are disparate treatment and disparate impacts and that we create solution, solutions, systems, institutions, and behaviors that account for that, okay? So if you're looking at uh, some of the um, climate change and some of the initiatives that are happening, um, we start to see that the algorithms uh, are based on profits that are privatized and losses that are public. And so if you have this value and you start to get to it with the cost benefit analysis and profits and some of that, you will start to see the algorithms are building that in. Um, I, we would argue you don't have to actually be, understand code and write. If you can understand the training data, which is all the information that's historically available goes into the algorithm and you look at the outputs, you can tell what the impact in the black boxes. And we can say, look, this is what's going in. Here's what's coming out. Modify what's happening in the box, right? So, uh, so then you can keep the IP, all the laws around uh, the um, intellectual property and all of that. 
Um, so what we're also seeing that the, um, the tools and the models are becoming more evident because the problems are so complex. So if you have all the environmental information from all the satellites and uh, the NOAA, which we've been working with NOAA on the data that they capture in the oceans, that's a huge database, right? But it allows me to see what the weather is going to be in six days. And then you take all the economic data from the census tracts, from um, both the you know, income, um, even resume, if you take all that economic data, and then you take the social determinants of health. So now you take all the health outcomes that come from, that's a lot of data. And, there, and there, we are now using all that data to help us make decisions, right? And so the, the further we get from um, what the decision makers are, so that needs to have diversity inclusion, then the, the less likely we are to understand those um, decision-making tools. Um, and so again, when we look at it, we do see now that the uh, tools, the algorithms are actually producing a new frontier of redlining. So we have started to uh, see the patterns. We look at, we take the, uh, the outcomes of the decision, if it's water, if it's energy, transportation. Uh, we, you know, I'm in DC um, to work, we've worked with DOE, DOT, NOAA, Treasury, EPA on talking about what does it look like? What's the impact on communities of color and low-income communities? Um, and we're seeing this pattern um, of because the data, the training data takes all that historical decision-making and just puts it into and moves it forward. So we have to change the way uh, that the, the uh, input comes in. Uh, and the other part that's emerging as well is, uh, for all of us is, um, you know, the FinTech. So the, the way that we are doing, the capital markets are working and the way that we are using resources. I mean, I, I, I haven't been to a bank and I don't know how long, right? Mm -hmm. You just do it all digitally, but that's also creating disparate impacts for those who don't now have broadband or don't have access or don't have the devices. They're being left behind, which means the data of their usage is also not included, right? So it all starts to, if, if you start to think about like algorithms and the modeling, that it, it encompasses your whole of life. It's not just that we're talking, you know, yes, the environment that you live in, but it's also the economics and it's also the place that you live. Um, so we're seeing the uh, technology being captured in all kinds of, of ways. Now, the, to, the, to the plus side, um, we see all of these GIS, so these geographical information systems, these GIS, map, GIS mapping also can tell us where are the areas um, that can most benefit from whatever policy or decision you want to make? And where are those who um, will be overemphasized, underemphasized? And you can actually use some of this digital data to help us then create equity, right? It's one of the, the few times where it's been uh, both the, the qualitative conversation of doing the right thing, what's the moral hazard? Um, versus the quantitative that I can see a community that is bright orange because it has disparate impact and di disparate treatment under the law that has now uh, has an opportunity to be centered and changed. Um, the tools that I would point to, so in California, years ago, we did a thing called, uh, we have a tool, and you can, those of you who have access, um, called Cal Enviro Screen, right? 22 indicators where you have the social determinants of health of a community. So that's asthma, heart disease. And they take those indicators and they and then we do the climate side. So that's, you know, our, our flood zones, our, we have extreme heat, wildfire. Uh, and then we put that on a map. So in California, we use that tool to help us with policy making and resource distribution. And we have been working with on the federal level on a tool that, for the uh, EPA called CGES. So um, CJUS has that same tool. And again, because we were like, what's the bias in the data? What's the training data? Run it through the, the box and what comes out on the other end. And it was so highly correlated with race. It was just crazy because you're like, we didn't, you know, the decision makers weren't like, let's do something that's, you know, race neutral. No, they were like, this is the fair thing to do. This is the right thing to do. And yet it all came out race bias. And so then we say, okay, so how do you correct that? Or how do we at least create something that is more neutral until we get them to some solutions? Um, 
And, and I wanted, I got about a minute here. Okay, so uh, solutions then as we see them, procedural equity is also was brought up so that uh, we would lift that up. Meaningful participation um, at the front end um, and in the middle and at the back end, transparency, there's a complete lack of transparency, uh, a lack of future engagement. So even let's just you see just, uh, EPA, okay, thanks. Um, that um, even when we made comments and recommendations and, and in the DGES model, there were over 2,600 comments. We don't know which ones they took. <laughs> like, okay, which ones did you take? And then, then it'll go through and then it's like, will we have another chance to comment? So there's the, um, the lack of future participation and then the diversity and the decision makers, as I mentioned, and then you have to publish. The transparency comes from publishing. So publish the impacts, you heard before, publish the risks, and then um, what are the, uh, the critical decision-making points um, that need to um, happen? So uh, I'll, I'll pause there. Uh, I know I brought a, a lot of uh, different perspectives, but I, I think if you can think of the, the landscape of algorithms and how pervasive and pernicious it is, it'll help you then analyze, mm -hmm. you know, even the four degree conversation that was had earlier, and then there's gonna be an ESG conversation Mm -hmm. That sort of perspective will help you, I think, you know, create the, the laws and policies that we think will be most effective. Thank, thank you, Deborah, and thank, thank you for sort of trying to tie it all, all together. Um, I want to give you a chance to respond to comments you heard, and then we're going to go to Tasia for the first question. Great. Uh, so first of all, thank you, everyone, for the time that you put into this. I'm learning so much from all three of you, uh, so thank you for being here. Um, Debra, thank you too for starting out with Cesar Chavez. I think that's really important. There's actually a, a good tie in here um, because what I've heard from all three of you in different forms is kind of questions about who's carrying the burden and what kinds of investments are we willing to make in terms of time and money. Uh, one of the, you know, kind of pernicious and kind of academia is like not too interested in this, but from a practitioner standpoint, it's really important. PUCs across the country, which, you know, like regulate energy utilities and are responsible in part for their transfer transformation, uh, don't have enough staff. Mm -hmm. Like they lose mm -hmm. their staff all the time. Governments lose staff all the time. Mm -hmm. So the people who we need to be working on these things aren't there. And in place of that, you know, like you were saying in Nebraska, right, like people end up relying on computer programs rather than staffing. And so there is kind of a, a labor tie in to like how, what are we willing to spend money on in order to create the kind of system in order to solve these problems. Okay, that's a little bit of an aside, but I was so glad that you brought that up. So thank you. Um, investment in time, I think, is, and burdens are also important when you're thinking about um, should we place the burden on marginalized communities who by definition are already marginalized and already, you know, like have other things to do, um, to put an additional effort to understanding, you know, like how hydropower modeling works. Is that really fair? Um, what do we need to do to engage those communities? And at what point do we do that? I think is a really important question that I have not answered. Um, and then there's another flip side to that, which is we don't have a lot of time to adapt to climate change uh, or to mitigate climate change. Like all of this needs to happen really quickly. Public participation takes a lot of time. So doing this in an, an efficacious way is something I think that also needs to be worked out too. Um, Mohit, I really am enjoying your, your application uh, of a new framework to Gary Kasparov. Uh, but I, I think actually your, your suggestions are practical and it fits a lot with what both Keith and Deborah said. So Deborah, you know, you pointed out uh, the importance of understanding training data. That is a huge focus. I think that fits nicely uh, into Mohit's you know, key parameters. But I think the geographic scope that you brought up as well is also pretty key and, and may also fit into what Greenline does also in terms of where are you kind of trying to make those boundary decisions. Um, and that's where I think my, my initial framework might come in a little bit too. Um, 
yeah, you all brought up way more than I could address in five minutes. So I think I'll keep my comments there, but I'm looking forward to continuing discussions. Thank you. Tasia, do you want to pose the first question? Sure. Um, and I, I think the discussion has started a little bit already, but my first question was about um, that question of burden, um, because it seems like the your article does a really great job presenting the framework as helpful for both developers of these tools and then advocacy groups or impacted groups that might want to evaluate them um, afterwards. Uh, but the ideal situation would be, it seems like for the developers to kind of engage in this inquiry as they're creating these tools. Um, so I was wondering if, um, you know, you all could talk more about what you see as the incentives or paths towards um, getting developers to do this work proactively um, knowing that there may be some kinds of evaluations that are always helpful to have on the back end, but just how do we get to having this happen on the front end? So uh, I'll I'll take that question first, if you all don't mind. Um, if you look at the engineering and engineering and social science literature, there's quite a lot of work being done on this. Like this has been a known problem for decades. And there's a lot of research, particularly about getting end users um to be more helpful earlier on that said i think that there's some important things about keeping developers siloed at times uh and i don't want to lose sight of that because it takes some creativity and it takes a lot of technical expertise and it's during those initial kind of stages where where they can kind of get traction so it's easy to get muddied down um if you don't already kind of have an initial idea so there's kind of a timing problem there um but in terms of incentives you know government has a lot of incentives it's great for developers if a government decides to adopt their model that's a really good contract then they can take it to elsewhere and say look like this amazing jurisdiction is using this so this happened with resolve which is one of the the models that i talked about in my paper um, you know, a model that they developed, I think, for California at first, Mohit might know this better, but also used in Hawaii and other states as well. And so by having that initial contract, there are incentives that you can put in place about, or even just rules about, look, we're going to have workshops to figure out how to do this and, you know, include people in this earlier. Uh, so those are my, my initial thoughts. Do you want to yeah, okay, so I, I definitely have some thoughts. <laughs> uh, so the academy is really jumping in. So we, you know, we sit um, right between UC Berkeley and Stanford. So we have two real big sort of think tanks. So Berkeley, we participated there. They're, they're submitting um, for, I think it's the EPA grant of the hydrogen hub. So they're going to do six to seven billion dollar hydrogen hubs. Uh, so some innovation and creativity on the development side uh, is going to be coming uh, through to help facilitate that. Then, uh, you know, down at Stanford, they just stood up a sustainability school. And the question is, how much does it cost to stand up a sustainability school? It's like $1.7 billion. But they just stood it up, and the venture capital is being incentivized by the IIJA and the IRM. You guys know these acronyms by now. Um, at, because the public funds and the production tax credit, right, back to profits and losses, privatized and, and public, um, production tax credit, investment tax credits are significantly significant enough to make those projects pencil now. So you've got the, the public dollars coming in with the private dollars to incentivize the market um, in big ways that are very innovative. Um, and, you know, both you have it both at a public institution and a private institution, so I'm sort of really hopeful um, that the, we we will be able to activate um, some innovation around the energy that we need um, from everything from you know the, the hydrogen, all rainbow colors of that, to uh, wind farms. We have big wind farms off the northern coast of California. Um, so I think there is incentive there now. And then it's just some creativity that needs to um, take place and, and then risk. It's a risk reward kind of profile, but I, I'm encouraged about uh, innovation. I'll add something to this. So I, I think a fair amount about what Sonia said about what's the right balance between engaging versus burdening. Folks have a lot going on in their lives and participating in deep technical conversations may or may not 
be the best use of their time. So I think at a minimum, what developers, regulators can do is understand needs of communities in relation to what they're working on. And if they do that right, over time, people will see the outcomes of processes because there's no real substitute for trust. In today's political environment, there is a lot of broken trust, trust so folks want to participate everywhere to make sure things are going right. But that's not sustainable over the long term. And one way I've been thinking of getting out of that is really understanding needs in relation to what you're working with and outcomes and how they would impact communities, integrating that and over time building that trust. But there's no, I don't see a better way to do that. But if you do, tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'll just give a, sure. a, a quick thought on that, which is less an answer than a question that I have and one of the things that I'm working mm -hmm. on, which is um, we, so in the in the government processes, in the public processes, right, there'll be regulations go out for comment or a new tool goes out and it's sort of this public comment period. Um, that's one way in, in, in where the public engages and to try to, um, it's, it's entities like the Green Mining Institute or NRDC that kind of the public writ large relies on to represent the, the sort of non-directly non commercial interests, right? Whether it's environmental um, values generally or representing um, disadvantaged communities to sort of get their input into the process. Um, the, one of the things that we'll be doing at, at the Department of Energy over the next 10 years, as you mentioned, one is like sort of hydrogen hubs, there's like $100 billion of grant programs and then another two or $300 billion of loans that are authorized to try to build out the infrastructure to do that, you know, to help accelerate the energy transition. And one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about and trying to talk to colleagues about is figuring out for those reviews of individual projects, you know, the hydrogen hubs that's going to go somewhere on the outskirts of Palo Alto or, or in Oakland where we used to have refineries or, you know, wherever they're going to go, how do we improve the participation of the people directly affected of the disadvantaged communities without it being burdening? Um, and how do we make sure that those people in that area that will uh, get those some benefits and a lot of burdens are in fact able to get their voices heard, whether it's via better engagement with uh, existing NGOs or directly into the process. But sort of closing that, I don't mm -hmm. know, that, 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 that particular part of it on the specific ones is, and again, if people have good ideas of how to do that, um, mm -hmm. I would I'd love to hear them because um, we're in the process of focusing on that and building that out now. And I know you're over time, but I, I think that's what the Justice 40 is trying to do. Justice yeah. 40 is, yeah. yeah. So the, the, if you don't know, Justice 40 is 40% 40 of the benefits, not the investment. Yeah. 40% of the benefits will go to disadvantage. And so that's to sort of say, if you put a, you know, uh, uh, you respond to an RFP, you will get points and credit for uh, how well you address Justice 40. Mm -hmm. So that and, sort of, and then that oh, gets, oh, that that, no, 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 it doesn't. Yeah. That also gets us into the question of the algorithms of how we calculate <laughs> that right. also that's making right. that's transparent. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm talking about that additional piece of that of, yeah. of making sure that we're valuing the things yeah. that would be valued by those people yeah. in that particular area. And that it's not just the product yeah. of an algorithm. But anyway, sorry. No, no, I mean, we're running a little bit over again. Like, note to self, we need more time for these panels. Um, does anyone, I know Mike is has a burning question. I have a question, but does anyone in the audience um, have a, a, want to respond to anything they, they've heard? Uh, question that I, that, I, that I come to. And I'm going to repeat to the webinar here. Pardon me? I'm going to have to repeat what you say to the webinar. Oh, oh, that could be a problem. <laughs> um, uh, so a, a, a question that I come to uh, with, with this panel is, uh, Sonia, I, I really appreciate your point about uh, transparency. Uh, uh, of the algorithm, and that really that really impacts what I'm thinking today. Uh, but Keith, you started to touch on a question in my mind: is 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 the real problem uh, the data? You know, are are the algorithms uh, pretty much faultless in the process of bad outcomes? Is is the input data um, uh, the the real um, the real problem, the source of the problem, and uh, if, if that's true, how do you regulate that? Is, is there something like uh, an FDA for the health of, of input data to algorithms? Uh, that, 
I have a very, I'll, I'll try to be a quick answer. I mean, I think the answer is that it's, it is both actually. So the, we need to be aware of the possible biases in the algorithm at all. Uh, chat GPT, so when I asked it, how do I know your answers are not biased? <laughs> said, as an AI language model, I do not have personal beliefs or biases. My responses are generated based on patterns and associations learned from a large corpus of date text data. However, the accuracy and relevance may depend on quality of data used to train me as well as the phrasing and specificity. <laughs> I would actually, sorry, that would, I would take issue with chat GPT there of even saying that the response, you know, does not have, pers does not yeah, necessarily yeah. biases because if the large corpus of language that it is trained on has underlying biases mm -hmm. yes. in it, Right. It's still going to be reflected in there. Um, and so, but uh, I, I think the quick answer is that it's, we need to be aware and mindful of both. And we need to engage a wider variety of people into the development of these mm -hmm. to help spot and uncover where those biases yeah. might be. That might not be spotted if it's just uh, so in the in the in the model development that's done, you know, for a lot of the, like the federal energy models, the Energy Information Administration that does uh, the energy outlooks every other year has a big national energy modeling system model. Uh, you referenced it in the in your article mm -hmm. that this is, you know, Congress and in, in the Inflation Reduction Act said, hey, build more integrated uh, damages assessments into this as well. So that model, by rule, is required to be is required to be public and publicly available like any of us, any of us, I went looked at the systems requirements, anybody with a Windows 8 computer can go and download the national energy system, energy modeling system, and download a little bit of proprietary software and run the basic case. And there are companies who have downloaded it and modified it. So in that sense, it's transparent. Mm -hmm. But when we develop it, it's still developed and the re review goes with a bunch of energy modelers who are very good and they might have these other Mm -hmm. issues in mm -hmm. mind, but it's not their focus or expertise, right. even if they're trying to be mindful of them. I'm going to, uh, once again, volunteer the panel to stay for 10 minutes here during the break, and, and people can come up and chat and, and ask questions if that's all right with you guys. And I know you want to say one thing in closing, but before you do, I'm just going to say lunch is going to be available. The other room, grab a box. We're only taking a 10-minute break again, so take more time if you need it, but come back with your box lunch. Webinar, folks, sorry, it turns out when you start a webinar, you cannot stop a webinar, so you're going to hear what's going on unless you mute the audio. We will take some pictures for the sandwiches for our virtual audience. Yeah. Well, we're good there. Right. So I wanted just to raise a, a, a question. Again, we are in a partially academic setting and could see if we can take it to one more level. And my question draws on your overall thesis, I think, and, and part of, of what Keith talked about in terms of transmission. And I think uh, part also of what Mulhit talked about in terms of discount rates. And then uh, ultimately, Deborah, your overall thesis. And that is um, for the climate problem, uh, the concerns, a substantial amount of the carbon we release today will still be uh, warming the planet 500 generations from now, right? And that means that the disadvantaged communities that will be harmed today also will be the descendants of those disadvantaged communities will be harmed for 500 generations. And yet we tend to talk about justice and equity as if it's all in this generation. So I'm curious about how the algorithms or the underlying data can be dealt with to account for the idea that we have a multi-generational problem at work here and that maybe one of the biggest injustices we face is that the most disadvantaged communities offspring are gonna be the most disadvantaged by climate. I'll give you a quick example that relates to Mohit's point. An environmental economist a little over a decade ago uh, said that the entire economic value of the planet in 200 years using the then recommended OMB discount rate would be valued at about $10 billion today. So, you, you know, a, a pure cost benefit analysis, you wouldn't spend 10 billion plus $1 to save all the economic value of the planet in 100, 200 years. It just tells us how much or kind of what seems like a neutral value can also have an intergenerational justice question. Are there are people already thinking and writing about that? Are, are those issues implicated in what you do? Or how should we all think about the intergenerational as well as the intragenerational question? Um, I'll, I'll take a first swing at it. So your question really is about a choice. Of, I think of it as, at the intersection of choice of values. How much do you value future impacts versus today's impacts? Mm -hmm. And an economic question, given our limited resources and funds today, how much should we work to say, I used to live in Oakland, how much money should go to hunger and housing? versus climate change that would impact people a few hundred. So 
I think all I'm reflecting is that you're really asking a political question. And that and algorithms can take that answer and use that as an input and give you a recommended solution. But that really is a central political question. And I don't know what else to say about that. So I'll take a little bit. There is a, so one on the question of it's thinking about it and writing about it. There's a fantastic wealth of writing in the economic space and the climate space of trying to tease that out. That's that's addressing it um, two, two ways. The one is the the political policy moral question of how much do we uh, put the value on the damages later in time. The other one is a, a factual question of what information do we have about how people actually do value things? We don't have many markets for actions that happen 100 years in the future, much less 200 years in the future, but right. we do have some things. So we published a paper. So, we asked people if you had $100 right. to buy a better reputation, how much of it would you put toward your reputation today versus your reputation after you die? If you ask most economists, they'd say zero after you die because right. I'm dead, right? But people answered $40, basically, that they would put 40 bucks toward their reputation after, which gives you some indication that they do value it. That the they future. do value it. Yeah, and so there are people who've done, you know, based on, 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 uh, UK housing data and the value of freehold estates versus 99 year leases, which most things are saying have come up with disc, you know, what the market actually reveals about discount rates to the extent that there's an empirical basis for it, they tend to be pretty low discount rates that would value those future damages higher than would be done by the usual market measures. Um, but and that's also, as he mentioned in the uh, the biggest difference in the different values on the social cost of carbon and the EPA calculations and the interagency working group are whether or not you include international damages or not. But the other one is what discount rate do you use? Right. And it, right. if it's at one, you know, from one to 7%, and yeah, there, there isn't necessarily a right answer. In right, there. right. Yeah. I'm getting the hook here. I don't know if you but, wanted to I close up. Yes. Yeah. Tip that a little bit. If you're valuing, the question is, what are you valuing? And then if you center, what are you centering? So if you center those who have been most impacted, you're going to get a different valuation yeah. than if you center those who have had resources. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the, the, you can use whatever discount rate, you can do whatever cost benefit, but if, what, is, what is it that you're valuing? And that would materially, and it does when we're talking with some of these algorithmic um, uh, algorithms um, that it changes the way they actually write the algorithm if they're centering something different. I can't what? resist to say one thing, sorry, Sonia, no. is that one of the issues with the social cost of carbon that made the news was mortality and lives are valued differently in different countries right. mm -hmm. based on a person's willingness to pay and economic mm -hmm. ability to pay. Mm -hmm. So if you follow what Deborah just said, it's countries that are not wealthy and are hot, where most of the deaths would occur, where lives are valued the lowest. Yeah. And if you change that, the value of the social yeah. cost of carbon yeah. would jump higher. Yeah. Well, thank you all very much for a really important conversation. Please stay. And we're coming back at 12.55. Right. Okay. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. You uh, I didn't have a chance to weigh in on that. I, I just think I find that your generation gets.
Okay, we're going to get started again. Sorry for the delay for the webinar um, participants. Welcome back. If you're just joining us, I'm Linda Bruggen. I'm a senior attorney with Environmental Law Institute. This is Mike Vandenberg with Vanderbilt Law School. Um, those of you who are eating um, or need to still come and go, that's totally fine, but we want to try to stay on schedule. So I do want to remind you we have a reception right after it too, because I know we haven't had a lot of time to talk in between. So please, um, please stay for that. And um, I want to remind uh, the folks that are on via webinar, if you have any tech issues, put them in the chat and our tech team will get back to you as soon as possible. If you have questions, put them in the question box. And there are instructions in the chat for how to make different windows bigger than others as you're watching um, the webinar. So with that, um, I am going to hand it over to Thomas Boyton, who is a third year Vanderbilt Law student and article editor for this article, and he is going to introduce our panel. Hi, everyone. As Mr. Bragan said, my name is Thomas Boyton. I'm a third year law student at Vanderbilt. I'm an article editor for Elmar. Um, so we're here to discuss the article, Do SG Mutual Funds Deliver on Their Promises by Quinn Curtis, Jill Fish, and Adriana Robertson. Um, unfortunately, Quinn Curtis isn't with us today, but we are lucky enough to have Jill and Adriana over Zoom. Uh, Jill Fish is a Saul A. Fox Distinguished Professor of Business Law and Co-Director of the Institute for Law and Economics at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. She's an Associate Reporter of the American Law Institute's Restatement of Corporate Governance. She previously worked as a trial attorney at the DOJ and worked at the law firm Clearly, Gottlieb, Steen, and Hamilton, and taught law at Harvard Law School, Columbia Law School, and Georgetown University Law Center. Uh, she received her BA from Cornell University and her JD from Yale Law School. Um, Adriana Robertson is a Donald N. Prisker Professor of Business Law at the University of Chicago Law School. Her research interests lie at the intersection of law and finance, including securities law, capital markets regulation, corporate finance, and business law. Adriana held the Honorable Justice Frank Iacobucci Chair in Capital Markets Regulation at the University of Toronto Faculty of Law with a joint appointment at the Rotman School of Management. She has held visiting professorships at NYU Law School and Yale Law School. Um, she holds a BA from the University of Toronto, a PhD in Finance from the Yale School of Management, and a JD from Yale Law School. Um, for our panel, we are accompanied by Catherine Jeffroy, Stephen Hall, and Ann Kelly. Uh, Catherine Jeffroy is an employee benefits and executive compensation associate at Arnold Reporter in Chicago. Her practice covers employment, compensation, and benefit issues, including the design, implementation, and administration of employee benefit plans and benefit plan fiduciary considerations. Uh, Ms. Jeffroy graduated with a Bachelor of Arts in Economics and Political Science from Wesley College and received her JD from the University of Illinois College of Law. Um, Stephen Hall, we have also over Zoom. Um, he is a legal director and security specialist at Better Markets. He currently serves on the Commission on Sanctions and Fitness on the Certified Financial Planner Board of Standards. He previously served as senior counsel to the Committee of Financial Services on the U.S. House of Representatives and as counsel to the North American Securities Administrators Association. Uh, Stephen completed his undergraduate degree at the University of Michigan and received his law degree from Georgetown University. Um, lastly, we have Ann Kelly. Um, she's the Vice President of Government Relations at Ceres and leads Ceres Policy Network's Business for Innovative Climate and Energy Policy. Anne is also an adjunct professor at Boston College Law School, serves on the boards of the Environmental League of Massachusetts and Massachusetts Interfaith Power and Light, and is a fellow in the American College of Environmental Lawyers. Previously, Anne served as Special Assistant for EPA Region 1 Administrator John DeVillis and has taught at Tufts University, Suffolk University, and New England School of Law. She holds a BA from Michigan State University, master's from Harvard, and a JD from Western Michigan University School of Law School. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, professors, for being here remotely. I know you're really busy. You're at another conference, so thank you for joining us. And we're going to hand it over to you, professors, to tell us about your article. <clears throat> So I can't see, can you see our slides or there are slides? All right, this is a very odd uh, setup. So I can't really follow what's going on here, but I'm gonna give it a shot and quickly turn it over to Adriana so that um, I don't embarrass myself. Um, but very briefly, next slide, please. 
Um, so this is based on a paper that we did from a couple of years ago. Um, sorry, I'm going to make this bigger. Yeah, okay, got it. Um, and obviously, uh, ESG investing uh, continues even uh, since the time that we uh, did our empirical analysis to get more both significant in terms of the number of dollars and more controversial. Um, it's also stirred a, a pretty active debate. Uh, so we see this with respect to the SEC, various proposed rulemakings, the debate about the Department of Labor and its policy. And so we seek to address two questions that we think animate that debate. What, one, what are investors getting when they invest in ESG? And two, what are investors giving up? Uh, next slide, please. All right, since uh, the publication of our paper and even set since we sent in uh, our slides, there have been uh, continued developments. So as I said, a number of pending rulemakings by the SEC, and we don't know exactly if and when those rules are going to be finalized. Um, the, SEC, the Department of Labor adopted a, a rule to remove barriers to ESG investing. Uh, Congress uh, voted to void the uh, Department of Labor's rule, and as I said, after we prepared these slides, uh, President Vido, Biden got to exercise his first ever veto authority to veto uh, the congressional resolution. Next slide. Um, we uh, looked at whether ESG funds differed from non-ESG funds, and we're focusing on uh, primarily on funds that use the name ESG. So this work also intersects with the paper that we're presenting at another conference uh, uh, later today that focuses on the SEC's names rule. But we look at the differences across four dimensions, composition, voting behavior, costs, and performance. Uh, and to summarize very briefly, we found that ESG funds do differ from non-ESG funds. They differ both with respect to the securities they hold and how they vote the securities. And we also found that ESG funds don't uh, cost more or underperform non-ESG funds. Next slide. A couple of caveats, actually a lot of caveats, because as I said, this paper uh, and the empirical work is now a few years old. So please just click, uh, keep advancing slowly. So number one, uh, with respect to what is ESG, right? That's a tough question. Um, and even over the course of the last several years, people have kind of shifted their views about, for example, fossil fuels in light of the war in Ukraine. Um, so it's a big tent. A lot of issues can constitute ESG. And a lot of people have said you should be more precise in answering the question whether these ESG funds are ESG enough. But when people disagree on what exactly ESG is, that's a hard question to answer. Keep advancing, please. Um, so, you know, is Tesla ESG? It's great on um, uh, electric cars, perhaps not so great on employee policies. We don't adopt our own definition of ESG in this paper, uh, advance please, um, but instead we rely on the work of uh, four different ESG ratings organizations. And you know, four is a lot. Uh, they use different methodologies. We think this gives, this a, gives us a fair amount of robustness. Um, second, um, what is an ESG strategy? There are a variety of strategies. Uh, you can choose to hold green or ESG securities. You can choose to exclude non-ESG securities. You can do it industry or sector by sector and choose the better companies within each industry. So rather than exclude fossil fuel companies, you might hold the fossil fuel companies that are working to uh, affect the quickest transition. Um, you can hold the entire market and try to change the behavior of the companies in which you invest, so-called impact investing, and tilt-based strategies. And Adriana will talk a little bit more about that. Uh, keep going, please. Right. And of course, there are uh, e uh, the idea of ESG can be potentially very broad. We tend to sort of fall back on climate. That's the one that everybody sort of defaults to. But there are a lot of different kinds of values-based funds. We uh, like in particular the Catholic values-based fund, uh, which you know you could debate: is that an ESG fund or not? Um, next slide, please. So. Uh, 
second big caveat, we focus at a specific moment in time. ESG funds continue to grow in size and in number, and they continue to evolve. So our work has caused us to look pretty carefully at the market, at the funds that are out there, and at the information they disclose, and it's a moving target. Uh, keep advancing, please. Right. Um, as I said, oh, go back. There's there's increasing variety uh, on both the left and the right in terms of ESG funds. So you know, MAGA fund and the drill fund. There are sort of anti ESG funds as well. And in addition, there are some non ESG funds that purport to consider ESG issues. So how do you factor that into an empirical analysis? And finally, I just want to flag the fact that performance analysis is very time specific. Right. So if you go back a few years during the tech bubble, you could hold a low carbon uh, portfolio that could consist primarily of tech stocks. When tech stocks were doing well, it looked like ESG funds were outperforming the market. More recently, as I said, with various uh, uh, factors like the Ukraine war, um, uh, uh, fossil fuels have been outperforming uh, tech companies. And so ESG funds arguably are underperforming the market, certainly over the last year. So um, when we talk about performance, we looked at a specific moment in time. We're not purporting to make general statements about ESG funds over the long term. All right, next slide. Adriana, you. <laughs> Hello. Um, so, uh, so what we wanted to do, can you all hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, excellent. Um, so if you could um, advance to the next slide, please. You know, it's an empirical paper. We wanted to just see, you know, are the funds doing what they say they're doing? What are investors getting? What are investors giving up? Just like Jill said. So the first thing, of course, we had to do was figure out, well, what funds are going to count as ESG for our purposes? So we ended up with three different categories of funds that we pulled in. Uh, the first are funds that had a name that indicated that it was sort of an ESG fund. So it could have said something like sustainable, responsible, greed, etc. cetera, um, in the name itself. The second thing we did was Morningstar, right, which is a mutual fund information provider that lots of investors rely upon. They identified certain funds as being ESG funds. So we just took that list. Now there was some overlap, of course, between that second list and the, the first one, but not complete. So we had both. And then finally, Morningstar also identifies a series of funds that it calls ESG consideration. This is what Jill was referring to when she said, well, some funds, they say they consider ESG without you know, purporting to actually be an ESG fund. Right? They just consider it in their decision making. So we consider that to be a third group. Next slide, please. You know, we took very standard data sources for the holdings and the performance, right? That was just um, the Center for Research and Securities Prices, Chris. As Jill said, we used ESG ratings from four different providers. We consider this to be a, an important strength of the paper because ESG ratings have often been criticized uh, from a number of different quarters for being uh, very poorly correlated with each other. So, you know, one ratings provider could say that ExxonMobil is pretty good. Another one might say it's pretty terrible. Um, we're kind of agnostic, so we figure, well, look, let's just take a bunch of different ratings providers and see what we find. As Jill said, it's a very specific sample period. It's what we had at the time. We wrote the paper in 2020. The market was changing rapidly, so we didn't want to go too far back in time. So we did 2018 and 2019. Next slide. Thank you. So as we said, the first concern is um, are investors getting what they think they're getting? The SEC is a, an investor protection entity primarily. And so we asked the question, well, is there any evidence that these ESG funds are systematically failing to differentiate themselves, right? Are investors getting something different from a conventional fund? And we looked in two dimensions, the portfolio tilt, what they're actually holding, and their voting behavior, because those are kind of the two main things that a mutual fund provides to investors. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So to figure out whether these ESG funds were more ESG than conventional funds, what we did was we just constructed uh, for each fund in each quarter, because the data we have are quarterly, uh, how ESG, what is the average rating, the weighted average ESG rating of the portfolio that it holds, right? So that's all we're doing when we calculate the tilt. It's just the weighted average rating. And again, we're gonna use four different ratings providers. We're gonna take every constituent of the fund's portfolio, multiply it by its rating as provided by the relevant rating provider, multiply by the weight and add them all up. 
Uh, so if we go to the next slide, what you can see here is what this ends up looking like. So the, the empty bars, the, the hollow ones, those are the conventional funds, the non-ESG funds in our sample. The gray bars, that's the, the weighted average for the ESG funds in our portfolio. And what you can see here is that with each of the four different ratings providers, the gray bars are kind of shifted, right? We still get a distribution in both, but the ESG ones are systematically more ESG, higher rated on average than the non-ESG funds, right? Now, we can talk about whether, and, and as Jill said, is this enough? Is it enough more ESG than the conventional funds? We can talk about that. We don't really have a position on that. We don't really have a benchmark on what it means to be ESG enough, uh, but it's certainly the case that they are doing something different, right? They do tend to be uh, more green, uh, more ESG, than conventional funds. And the other thing that's important about this, I just want to flag, is that this came out with all four of the ratings providers, notwithstanding the fact that they all have very different methodologies. And there's no way for you to know this other than I'm just going to tell you and you'll have to take our word for it. Um, we actually wrote the paper using the first three of these ratings providers uh, because we hadn't gotten data from the fourth one yet. And then we got the fourth set of data, uh, we calculated it, and it turned out, so it's kind of like an external validity test. It turns out that actually everything went through with the fourth data provider. So that was kind of an encouraging thing uh, to have happen. We didn't reverse engineer it. Uh, next slide, please. Here, we just run a, a regression where we, this way we can include a bunch of controls. Uh, and all you see is that this is true. It's not just true in the picture. If we control for things, you still get a more positive, right? That the coefficient is positive. Uh, that's all I really want you to take away from this slide. On average, yes, they are higher rated. Uh, mm -hmm. The next thing we ask, because the other thing that you get from a fund is the voting. So we just ask whether they vote differently. And here what we did was we wanted to know if these funds tend to be more independent of management. That was the proxy that we sort of went with. So we looked at the propensity to oppose management. Uh, we tried to isolate ESG funds versus their families. Uh, we looked at shareholder proposals, and we also looked in particular at environmental funds, because we actually read the descriptions to see what the funds are purporting to offer. We looked at environmental funds' propensity to vote against management for shareholder proposals on environmental issues. Uh, and then finally, you know, uncontested director elections, that's just, again, a general propensity to oppose management, to be more suspicious <laughs> of management. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, you know, again, all we really want you to take away from this is that the coefficients are all positive, right? They're all coming out the way you would expect, which is telling us that ESG funds are more likely to vote for shareholder proposals, right, against management for the proposal. Environmental ones in particular, that second column, are more likely to vote for environmental shareholder proposals. Right? So they are doing something a little bit different. The third column, that's just telling you that ESG funds are also more likely to oppose management. Uh, the only difference between columns one and three and four through six is we just have different sets of controls right, to try to make sure that this analysis is robust. So that's all we want you to take away from that. The next thing we ask is, okay, well, that's what the investors are getting. They are getting something a bit different. Well, what are they giving up? Right? And this is the DOL's primary concern, right? that the ESG funds are sacrificing pecuniary performance for these non-pecuniary gains. So here we just ask, is there systematic evidence uh, that they're underperforming relative to conventional funds? Either are they more expensive or is their performance worse? Okay. Uh, next slide, please. So here, all I want you to take away, there's no stars, the, there's no statistical significance, the coefficients are all zero. The funds are not more expensive. Uh, if you press next, please, a little red box should pop up. There we go. Just want to be very clear, we're not claiming that these mutual <laughs> funds are cheaper than like a broad-based, you know, two basis point S&P 500 fund offered by BlackRock. They're not. Right? They are more expensive than a two basis point fund. But guess what? There are lots of funds that are actively managed that charge more than two basis points that you know, people buy. Right? So if you don't like actively managed mutual funds, you're not going to like these ones. Uh, but as long as you're OK with buying something other than an ultra low cost fund, there's no particular reason to worry about these ones. Uh, next slide, please. The same goes when we look at, at performance. Uh, the, if anything, the performance is maybe slightly better in this time period. Uh, we don't want to put a ton of emphasis on that because as Jill said, it's sensitive to the time period, but certainly there's no reason to worry that the performance is worse 
uh, than comparable funds. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, I'll maybe pass it back to Jill to just very quickly uh, wrap up on the regulatory implications. So just, you know, uh, I know we're over time already, but uh, yeah, you know, the, our empirical findings uh, suggest that the moral panic that's uh, been driving particularly the SEC seems to be overblown. Uh, we don't think that ESG funds are distinctively or particularly problematic. They do seem to hold securities with more ESG tilt. Uh, they do seem to vote more independently than non-ESG funds. And while it might be true that you can't necessarily predict from the name or from the fact that somebody that something is an ESG fund exactly which security it holds. We think that's true of all mutual fund strategies, and we don't think that's something that's disqualifying or warrants distinctive regulatory treatment. Um, so uh, in particular, uh, even though this is now a paper that's a couple of years old, we think our paper has uh, particular implications for some of the SEC's uh, pending rulemaking proposals. Next slide. I think that's it. Right, so no obvious reason on the DOL side as well, uh, no obvious reason to discourage pension fund trustees from considering ESG factors, uh, but on the same, by the same token, no obvious reason to require that fiduciaries consider ESG. ESG factors should be like anything else that uh, uh, you know, warrants consideration uh, consistent with a trustee's fiduciary duties. And I think, that, that, think that's it, yeah. The end. Uh, that was that was wonderful, Jill and Edgy, and I. I can tell you've done just a few of these remote um, <laughs> presentations before. It was like you were in the room with us. Uh, it was great. Uh, and we're going to go now to actually being in the room uh, with some comments from Catherine. Hi. So I'm in employee benefits and executive compensation. And so when I read this paper, the first thing that I zoomed in on is you know the Department of Labor's regulation of allowing ESG focused investments in plan uh, retirement plans and the broader considerations that are informing the decisions that fiduciaries are making about what investments to include in a plan. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. And then also, as both the authors noted, this is an area where there's been a significant amount of development. So I'm just going to provide some updates to kind of level set so everyone understands the current legal landscape. Next slide. So under, underpinning much of this area is the Employee Retirement Income Security Act, which is also known as ERISA. Retirement plans such as 401k plans and pension plans are generally subject to ERISA. And ERISA contains certain fiduciary duties, which apply to retirement plan fiduciaries. Um, so for the purposes of this presentation, I'm, I'm going to focus on the duty of prudence because uh, the duty of prudence, you'll, you'll see a definition on the slide. But in this context, the importance of the duty of prudence is that fiduciaries have an ongoing duty to both select and on an ongoing basis to monitor the investments that are being included as options for retirement plans. And those, those investment options have to be prudent. So this is something that is of particular focus to plan fiduciaries because it is an area where there's been an increasing amount of litigation. So uh, fiduciary brief duty breaches uh, relating to selection of plan investments is something that there have been a significant number of class action lawsuits relating to. And increasingly, especially after a case that was decided in 2022 by the Supreme Court, these cases are increasingly getting more difficult, more complex, and potentially more expensive to defend. Next slide. So with all of that context, Prior to 2020, the Department of Labor did have sub-regulatory guidance, which was issued from time to time that addressed these sorts of ESG type funds. But in 2020, the Department of Labor actually released final regulations. There are a few key takeaways, which I wanted to highlight with, uh, in relation to the 2020 regulations. First, ERISA plan fiduciaries were not able to subordinate return or increase risk to promote non-pecuniary or non-financial considerations. Second, 
uh, if there was a tiebreaker. So if a fiduciary was looking at two potential investment options that they were considering including in the plan, and they thought that these two options were indistinguishable based on pecuniary factors alone, then if they wanted to use non-pecuniary factors to kind of break that tie to decide which investments to include, they had additional documentation requirements and disclosure requirements. And then the third takeaway here relates to qualified default investment alternatives are also known as QDIAs. QDIAs are essentially, if a participant in a 401k plan or a retirement plan is making selections about which funds to invest their retirement funds in, the QDIA is sort of the default option. The person doesn't make a choice, so the retirement funds go in this particular investment vehicle. It's typically target date funds or other similar blended investments. So the 2020 regulations said that ESG-focused investments couldn't be used as qualified default investment alternatives for an ERISA plan if the investment objectives or goals or the principal investment strategies include, consider, or indicate the use of one or more non-pecuniary factors. So it really limited the ability of fiduciaries to select ESG-focused investments as the default option for the plan. Next slide. There was a change in administration, and then <laughs> in early 2021, they, uh, the Department of Labor announced they would not be enforcing the 2020 regulation. And then subsequently later that year in October, they announced new, uh, new proposed regulations. And then the final regulations were officially released in December of last year. So a few key changes from the 2020 regulations to the 2022 regulations. In the 2022 final regulations, a prudent fiduciary may now consider any factor that's material to the risk return analysis. And this does include potentially ESG factors. Second, it allows fiduciaries to consider the collateral benefits of investments in the case of a tiebreaker. And third, it generally eliminates, with, with some exceptions, it eliminates some of the documentation requirements that were included in the 2020 ESG regulations. So the 2020 ESG regulations were generally seen as limiting the ability for plan fiduciaries to select ESG investments as uh, plan investment options. The 2022 regulations were generally seen as broadening that ability. However, I do want to reiterate kind of underpinning all of this, as I said, a lot of the fiduciary responsibilities derive from trust law. And so there's been longstanding Department of Labor guidance that a fiduciary has to focus on the interests of the participants and the beneficiaries. So even the 2022 regulations, they reiterate this sort of longstanding guidance. A fiduciary can't sacrifice investment returns or take additional investment risk in order to promote benefits other than the interests of the participants and the beneficiaries. Next slide. Hmm. There should be one slide left. We've taken that out just to make it <laughs> a little harder. Hope we don't mind. We do that randomly. <laughs> oh, just to just to you know, the slide. It's fine. Um, so <laughs> so the, mm. the last slide it just addresses some of the recent developments on ESG backlash. So. As the authors mentioned, this is an area that's become increasingly politicized. There's been a lot of political controversy. And so it's an area that's still currently under development on like a week to week basis right now. So on the state level, several states have passed anti ESG laws. Several states have had governors announce that no state pension funds will be invested in any investment vehicles that invest based on ESG principles. Um, and then a coalition of 25 states sued the Department of Labor to try to prevent the 2022 final regulations from going into effect. On the federal level, 
uh, there was legislation that was passed that sought to overturn the Department of Labor's 2022 final rule. Uh, President Biden did use his first veto of his term on this, uh, but the veto was not overruled. So it's not current law. But even since then, there have been articles that have said that in the House, there are already there's already some discussion of trying to create new bills, which would potentially revert essentially back to the 2020 rule, where you're not allowed to include non-pecuniary factors as a consideration when you're selecting plan investments. So that's sort of the current state of play. Obviously, things have changed even since the paper was published, um, but that's just to provide some of the broader context of the decisions that plan fiduciaries are actually making when they're trying to decide what to include as investment options. Catherine, thank you. Yeah, that's just a really important angle on this issue. I do want to note it's 1.30. We made it from 9.30 to 1.30 with no technology problems, and we now have two. <laughs> uh, we will post the full slide deck uh, with your last slide. Um, and our next speaker, uh, Steve, can you hear us? Uh, indeed, I can, and I'm sorry that I am one of the two uh, techno problems. I just lost the feed. I don't know why. I'm very sorry. I, I'm, I'm still looking forward to the discussion, and I'd love to uh, read my, my pitch, if I may. Please go ahead. We'd love to hear from you, and we're sorry we can't see you. <laughs> I, I do have an image of the room, fortunately, because I was, <laughs> I was connected for a little while. Anyway, uh, greetings to everybody. Uh, as Thomas said, I'm Steve Hall. I'm the legal director and security specialist for Better Markets. I'm really happy to be here and grateful for this uh, invitation to, to, to participate. It's obviously timely and important topic. Uh, Better Markets is a nonprofit public interest organization. We were founded 12 years ago to fight for a more fair, a stable, fair, and transparent financial system. A substantial amount of our advocacy is focused on improving the securities markets and fighting for important investor protections, including any fraud provisions, as well as clear and comprehensive disclosures that investors need and want to make more informed decisions. ESG investing is a strategy for allocating investment funds on the basis of the extent to which the operations of a company or a portfolio of companies affect the environment advance social justice or follow good corporate governance practices. It's of intense and increasing interest to literally millions of investors who seek to minimize financial risk and maximize financial return. It also appeals to investors who seek to align their investments with their core personal values. Now, the question before us today is how the SEC and to a lesser degree the DOL should regulate the ESG mutual fund market. The three distinguished uh, scholars on this panel have conducted some empirical analysis to gauge the need for additional regulatory oversight in this area. Now, taken at face value and without delving into the methodology, uh, we think the findings themselves are encouraging, at least as far as they go. Their analysis indicates, indeed, that ESG funds really do offer their investors increased ESG exposure, they vote shares in ways that support the ESG principles, and they do so without increasing costs or reducing returns for investors. To the extent this is true, these findings actually bode well for the ESG investment movement. But a key question is what conclusions should follow from these findings? The authors contend that in light of their study, there is no real reason to single out ESG funds for special regulation or what they refer to as regulatory intervention. Now here we part company at least to a degree. First, I'll note a little bit uh, of common ground. To the extent the authors oppose regulatory attempts to limit investor access to ESG products or to curtail their use by ERISA fiduciaries, we agree with them. And for that reason, we oppose the DOL's ideological and misguided attempt to inhibit the use of ESG investments by ERISA fiduciaries. Fortunately, as my colleague on the panel has noted, the DOL uh, amended the rule and it recently survived the Congressional Review Act resolution of disapproval, thanks to President Biden's first veto. Uh, however, our core point is that there are still very good reasons for additional regulatory requirements governing ESG funds. Such measures are necessary for at least three reasons. 
to protect investors from continuing abuse, to bring order to a complex and confusing market by requiring clear, standardized, and comparable disclosures, and to maintain investor confidence in the integrity of this evolving market so that it ultimately can fulfill its potential. In short, regulation of the ESG market is necessary not only to protect investors, but also to foster an environment in which it can thrive. Uh, and indeed, the, the SEC, as I'll explain in a minute, is headed in this direction by proposing two important rules. One, to prevent the use of misleading mutual fund names. The other, to provide investors in ESG funds with more detailed, consistent, and comparable disclosures. Before briefly fleshing out these points, it's important to highlight the attributes of ESG investing that largely influence, influence our thinking on the need for additional regulation. ESG investing is in huge demand. It's experiencing explosive growth. It's attracting trillions of dollars of investor funds. It has spawned a complex and confusing ESG investment industry. It offers attractive profits for mutual funds that can take advantage of investors' enormous appetite for ESG investing. And there's every reason to believe that these trends will continue and increase as the vast majority of millennials favor ESG investing. At the same time, investors are confronted by a daunting array of investment options and a lack of clear and consistent information about those options. There are hundreds of mutual funds, ESG related, hundreds of ESG rating providers using different methodologies and countless ESG indexes that track companies using various ESG metrics. And as the authors note, there isn't even a common clear definition of what exactly ESG means. So given this backdrop, the threat of investor abuse remains high in our view. In addition, the need for greater clarity, uniformity, and comparability in the disclosure of information about ESG investing should be clear. The case gets even stronger given the appropriate role for preventive regulation. Given the massive scale, popularity, and importance of ESG investing, the optimal approach in our view is to get ahead of potential and foreseeable problems. As the DC Circuit has said, regulatory agencies have the latitude to adopt prophylactic rules to prevent potential problems before they arise. Quote, an agency need not suffer the flood before building the levee, close quote. Thus, <laughs> even if the ES mutual fund marketplace were generally in good order, the SEC would be justified in establishing more guardrails to head off future problems. Now, I'll, I'll sort of wind down by briefly touching on the three reasons that I flagged uh, that explain why we think uh, additional regulation makes sense, investor protection, disclosure, and market integrity. Turning to investor protection, of course, there have been and continue to be patterns of misconduct in the world of ESG-focused mutual funds, and, and they warrant strong enforcement as well as regulatory measures, and the SEC's actions reflect these concerns. In March of 2021, the Commission announced the creation of the Climate and ESG Task Force within the Division of Enforcement to focus on inadequate and misleading ESG-related disclosures. A month later, in April of 2021, the, ESG, uh, sorry, the, the SEC's Division of Examinations issued a risk alert. It found that the rapid growth in demand, increasing number of ESG products and services, and lack of standardized and precise ESG definitions present certain risks. The alert went on to discuss several specific observations of deficiencies and internal control weaknesses identified during the examination of investment advisors and funds with respect to ESG invested. And of course, the commission continues to bring enforcement actions against issuers and funds for misconduct in climate and ESG related disclosures. Now, beyond enforcement, the SEC has also taken regulatory action to address potential abuses in the ESG marketplace. In June last year, it published a proposal to fortify what's known as the NAMES rule. That rule already requires funds to adopt a policy to invest at least 80% of their assets in accordance with the investment focus that the fund name suggests. The recent proposal would expand this requirement and apply it to fund names indicating that the fund's investment decisions incorporate the ESG factors. The rule would also require enhanced disclosures of, about how fund names track their investments, as well as prospective definitions of the terms used in a fund's name. 
The second area where regulatory intervention is especially important is in the realm of disclosure. The fact is that investors do not have access to clear, consistent, and comparable information on which to base their investment decisions when it comes to ESG investments. And the SEC has moved on this front as well. In June last year, along with the names rule, it published a proposal that would require investment companies to disclose to investors and report to the SEC additional information regarding their uh, ESG investment strategies. Um, the SEC has released actually nicely frames the core rationale for the rule. It says, quote, the proposed rules and form amendments are designed to create a consistent, comparable, and decision useful regulatory framework for ESG advisory services and investment companies to inform and protect investors while facilitating further innovation in this evolving area of the asset management industry, close quote. The SEC's reference to innovation is a good segue to the third and final reason why we support additional reform in the ESG investment market. Additional regulation of ESG funds will actually help this important movement thrive. New protections and requirements, including those the SEC has recently proposed, will satisfy investor demand for the accurate, complete, and consistent information they need to make optimal investment decisions. And it will fortify investor confidence in the integrity of the ESG market. In short, strong regulation means investor trust, which means greater investor participation, which means more efficient capital allocation, better returns, and more social good. And these benefits accrue whether investors are seeking ESG-related investments to save the planet or to reap better financial returns from companies that are well-positioned to adapt and profit from climate change and social trends. That concludes my opening remarks. Uh, very much look forward to the discussion. And once again, um, sorry to be, uh, to be remote by phone only, but uh, uh, still looking forward to participating. Great, thank you, Stephen. We, we could hear you very well and uh, appreciate your comments. And I uh, suspect we will be circling back in the discussion to uh, your recommendations. But first we're going to um, go to Anne uh, and thank you. hear from you. Thanks so much. Um, really appreciate the invitation. So much to say in so little time. And now I'm filled with thoughts about Steve's wonderful presentation as well. In a nutshell, I just want to remind you the series is actually a coalition of investors started in 1989. Um, in the wake of the Exxon Valdez spill, the sense of investors really wanting to do more than the law would allow them to do when it came to the performance of the companies. Thank you. Uh, we started out with a few socially responsible investors before that was a tarnished word, uh, religious investors, probably about half a trillion AUM assets under management. That network has grown uh, profoundly to include all kinds of asset managers and asset owners, including BlackRock, CalPERS, CalSTRS, about $37 trillion of assets under management. As we know, we own none of that. But one of the things we do is to educate investors about crucial issues so that they can engage with companies on corporate sustainability behavior. My, I run the policy shop on the um, in government relations, but I just wanted to clarify that that's where I think I was probably invited to speak a little bit from an investor perspective. And um, I, I'm loving the cool neutral analysis of all of our other speakers. I'm completely uh, biased. I'm an <laughs> that's why you're here. So thank you. I'm just going to own that right up front, Mike, and thank you for the invite. I haven't been to ELI for about 20 years, and it's terrific to be back. Um, I love the the article. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Adriana. A fantastic piece. Really needed to put this out. Uh, I could talk about so many of their conclusions that made perfect sense to us. Um, and one thing that leaps out at me, and I, I don't necessarily disagree, Steve, with the tweaks, and I'm going to call them tweaks that you just suggested by the SEC. Thank you for noting that most millennials support ESG. If, if that isn't enough of a reason to get behind it, <laughs> I would have guessed there's millennials and Gen Zs in this room. Yeah. Um, but you, and I want to make a really clear distinction between the kind of what Steve's calling for is legitimizing this area, getting more disclosure. We, of course, support robust disclosure. Investors, in fact, need neutral, clean, decision useful information. And that's why we so robustly support the SEC's rule around enhanced climate risk disclosure. That's what's going to lead to the fair allocation of capital. If you can understand the nature of the climate risk, then investors need to make that decision. But I want to make a distinguish, distinction between the kind of tweaks Steve is talking about for clarity, for naming, and the kind of uh, 
unfortunate activity that we're seeing at the state level that, that I'll refer to in a moment. Um, one thing about naming that Steve mentioned, I do want to point out that our authors were really astute, I thought, in their discussion of other funds. Something's called a growth fund. What's growth? People get into something called a blue chip fund. Really, what's that? So the, the rule is 20 years old, the naming rule. So yes, if we're going to do that, let's look at all these funds. And I really appreciated the way the authors put this in context and concluded, well, there's no extra regulatory layer needed from either the SEC or the DOL for this set of funds that you might not apply to other sets of funds. That said, what I hear Steve saying is that this area is important. It should grow. He actually used, um, I think he actually used social good to become a bad word at the state level with certain <laughs> parties. Um, and so to make it even better, what I'm here Steve saying, and he'll contradict me if I got that wrong, to make this even more robust, there's a reason why this is growing. Um, some tweaking is probably in order, and, and Steve, I, I can't disagree with you there. What a wonderful time to be in law school. You know, the, the, the thing you get to do in law school is to go over cases and law, some of which, with the benefit of hindsight, you say, oh, dear God, what were they thinking? <laughs> Plessy versus Ferguson, the Jim Crow laws, the fact that women couldn't vote. Where do you begin, right? And there was no internet then. We didn't get those people passing those laws, didn't necessarily get to know the political dynamics around those decisions the way you can. So you are seeing in real time just a stunning set of development um, at the state level in this area. And it allows you to really say, well, no, wait a second. How is this going to be looked at in 25 years, in 50 years, in 100 years? And people say, oh, by the way, what was that in the 2020s? Let's see, now they had seven years at that time before complete total <laughs> climate destruction. Okay. And so some people were trying to shift their mm -hmm, funds mm -hmm. to avoid climate risk and to participate in the opportunity of renewable energy. How dare they? Mm -hmm. Right. So you'll be able to, I, mean, I know that when you're reading the law now, you're thinking about this, such that you're able to separate clear legal matters and controversies from what is strictly political theater. Uh, Larry Fink, for what are investors thinking and doing and why? Larry Fink, chairman, CEO of BlackRock, for years now, we do climate risk and investment risk. That's still the case. One of the most critical tasks of an asset manager is to provide clients with insights on short and long-term trends in the global economy. Climate risk is such a trend. We believe that companies that better manage their exposure to climate risk and capitalize on opportunities will generate better long-term financial outcomes. What do you think? Climate risk is financial risk. That is the cold, hard fact. To ignore it would be a dereliction of duty. Michael Ferrix, Illinois State Treasurer. Kirsty Jenkinson of CalSTIR is the largest, second largest pension fund in the country. Ignoring pervasive risks such as market disruption by climate change and ignoring the investment opportunity presented by the transition to a low carbon economy, I was asking us really to stop doing our jobs. So I appreciated the detailed description of fiduciary duty. Understand, investors really want to make money. That's what we <laughs> want to do. If the marketplace is moving in this direction, you know, as much as I'd mm -hmm. love to believe that Larry Fink has a great big heart and must do the right thing, mm -hmm. the dude wants to make money. Let's just be honest about that. Most of these pension funds have to be thinking about long-term mm -hmm. income. They have to be thinking about the long-range plan for people like nurses and teachers and firemen who may not retire for 30 or 40 or 50 years. Mm -hmm. So that's their intention. That's what Kirsty Jenkinson, who represents a bunch of teachers, is getting at. Um, Ann Simpson, Franklin Templeton, we're not woke, we're awake. <laughs> she is the manager for Franklin Templeton, which of course has extremely conservative roots. She said, you know, what we're about is prudence, loyalty, and care, back to the definition of fiduciary duty. When it comes to ESG, her advice is keep calm and carry on. This is somebody who's been at this a very, very long time. So I guess my point is, this isn't Greenpeace, okay? I love Greenpeace. This is cold, hard investment strategy where you're going to get, you're going to do prudent risk management and you're going to look for opportunities. Okay. And so that's basically free market capital. And I have to quote here the governor of New Hampshire, Governor Sununu, Republican, who said, I, I probably don't love ESG, but it's not the government's role to overreach mm -hmm. and to start to determine where folks should make their investments. So as a result of the overreach that I'm going to describe in a moment that, that um, Catherine referred to, we launched a campaign last week called Protect the Freedom to Invest. And that's mm -hmm. my button, protectthefreedomtoinvest.org. It's just a whole lot of asset managers and asset owners saying, 
let's just protect the freedom to invest responsibly, allow the free flow of capital, which is a really conservative idea, and allow investors to make those decisions within the whole realm of possibilities. Again, not to say that some of Steve's criticisms were not warranted and that we could use tighter definitions, of course, more robust disclosure, more transparency, no question about it. But basically it's a movement to say, do not restrict. Well, why was this necessary? More than 130 bills have been introduced so far this year that would restrict investing practices by limiting or prohibiting consideration of non-financial or non-pecuniary factors. Well, here's where we have a point of controversy right away, don't we? We're calling it non-pecuniary. Well, that's funny, because Larry Fink said, climate risk is financial risk. I'll just tell you that Siri said that in 2003. She was saying, no, it's not. What are you talking about? Now, Wall Street is saying, climate risk is financial risk. I don't have to share with you the numbers about the weather disasters of the last year. Guess what? Business interruption. There's money to be lost. Damage happens. Taxpayers pay. It's financial risk. Again, it's Larry Fink saying that. It's not our beloved environmental colleagues. Um, in addition to the bills, there were bills that passed in Texas and West Virginia and Utah. There's now I don't want to, I can't do time to go over them all, but in mm -hmm. Arkansas and Idaho and Montana, um, passing bills that would prohibit ES considerations as an investment in pension funds. Okay. So again, this is partly a, a debate about long-term, short-termism, and I'd love our wonderful authors to take that on. <laughs> you know, your, your, your business school colleagues are discounting the future. We have valued the short-termism. That's one of Wall Street's problems, not looking into the long-term. Simply because you look at long-term assets does not mean that you're doing anything illegal. Our investors would suggest that that's consistent with, with your fiduciary duty. I think it's important that many of these efforts, including those in North Dakota, Virginia, and Wyoming, have been scuttled amid, amid revelations about the millions of dollars in additional taxpayer costs that these policies would result in. So a few examples. The Kansas State Division of Budget projected reduced returns of $3.6 billion over 10 years for the Kansas public retirement wow. system if the currently proposed investment restrictions were adopted. Huh. The Arkansas Public Employees Retirement system estimated they would lose 30 million to 40 million a year due to an anti-ESG bill that would require the state treasurer and public entities to divest from certain institutions that use ESG metrics. Same thing with the Indiana public retirement system that, could, that would result in reduced aggregated investment returns for defined benefit and defined contribution funds of 6.7 billion over 10 years. So such a decrease would reduce an estimated annual return of investment of from 6.25% to 5 0.05%. You know that as fiduciaries, these folks have a statutory duty to return. So what's going to happen then? Those employees are going to have to pay a greater contribution. So as a result of what are called fiscal notes at the state level, fiscal notes like what the CBO does at the federal level, what's this thing going to cost? Um, I'm happy to say that several bills have been defeated uh, in Wyoming and Virginia, where the session is now over, in Colorado, New Hampshire, North Dakota, Mississippi, and Tennessee. So when state, many of these states actually look at the numbers, many of these bills are, are crashing down. <laughs> and that's really important. And again, I, for our wonderful authors, um, were they to go back and do a little more analysis, it would be interesting to see you know, what has happened to those states where the taxpayers were actually negatively influenced as a result of these bills. And, mm. and you also have the benefit of looking at what's really behind these bills, what's really behind the effort. Are you using a word like woke in such an inappropriate context? Um, talking about someone doing something that might be good for people, how dare you, instead of having a financial return. But what I'm here to tell you is that these are hard pull calculations. The term ESG originated in 2004 with the UN Global Compact by a whole bunch of financial firms like HSBC, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley. Again, these are the folks who said, well, this will be a useful investment strategy. We can aggregate these things and we can create new investment funds. So I'll conclude. I'll look forward to your questions. I'd love to take this apart more fully, but just wanted to provide the larger mm -hmm. context. I think some of the cautions that we need to look at at the same time, certainly agreeing with our wonderful authors of the article and some of what Steve had to say as well. I look forward to your questions. And Thanks. you're such a font of uh, of information. I wonder, does Ceres have a, a white paper or something that includes a lot of the data that you just mentioned? I can imagine that would be very useful for people. Yes, <laughs> we do. Um, Freedomtoinvest.com. Okay. Um, I can't remember if we bought .com or .org. Much of the, many of the articles are there, but then I have my own private working paper that I'd be happy to share. Great, with you, Mike. that'd be great. 
That would be Thank great. You. Yeah, that's great to get that perspective. And it's funny that you quoted um, Ann Simpson on the we're not woke, we're awake, because she was going to be on this panel, but we had a scheduling problem. But she, when she was at CalPERS, was here, I guess, a year and uh, two years ago. So on a prior which got a real downgrade. Paper. With, on a yeah. prior yeah. Paper. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, she knows her stuff. Well, it's wonderful to, to get this range of perspectives. And before uh, we circle back uh, to uh, other commenters again and questions, I want to ask Adriana and Jill if they want to respond to anything they've heard. Adriana? Uh, well, I was going to say what I suspect uh, you were going to say, uh, which is related to the, the names rule um, that Stephen uh, mentioned. So it turns out Jill and I actually have a paper on that. Um, and, <laughs> and, and the reason we're not at this conference is that we're presenting that paper at another conference. <laughs> uh, so we'd be glad to send you the link uh, to the working paper. We actually, I guess we, we do disagree um, in the sense that we actually think that the, the proposed names rule um, is not not only is it unlikely to be helpful, uh, we actually think it, it is actively potentially harmful to ESG investing um, and to investor protection uh, for a couple of reasons, not because we disagree. I mean, we are very pro-truth uh, and we are very opposed to you know, mis misleading investors. We are anti-fraud. Um, <laughs> Let's make that clear. We, we are all on the same page on that. Um, as, as we understand it, as we read the proposed names rule, um, it actually seems to make it very, very difficult to engage in a wide variety of uh, well-known, well-respected, totally acceptable ESG strategies. Uh, they don't fit well within the proposed names rule framework. Uh, and moreover, we do sort of a, a fairly simple example uh, to show that, you know, it's just really hard to give investors a clear sense of what they're buying uh, just by putting it in the name. And so we do some some simple examples uh, to try to make that point and drive it home. Um, that being said, you know, it doesn't mean we don't think that more disclosure is better. Uh, we're just not sure that this particular rule um, is the way to get us there. Uh, yeah, I agree, of course, with all of that. But um, I guess, you know, we're academics. We are working really hard in both of these projects to try and figure out what's happening in this space from a market perspective and also what seems to be motivating uh, the SEC and better markets and a bunch of the people who are supporting more regulation. And I guess, you know, Steve, maybe offline you could help us out with a little bit more specifics. So in your remarks, you talked a lot about uh, potential problems and future problems and patterns of misconduct. And when I presented our other paper earlier this week, one of the uh, people in the audience said, well, what is the indication that there's really fraud in the ESG space? Is the SEC bringing enforcement actions? Are private litigants bringing enforcement actions? Because as um, Anne is at the first commentator, as Anne said, right, there's lots of litigation um, in the mutual funds uh, space. There's lots of potential for class actions. When we went through the SEC's rule, the SEC said, well, there's all this money investors are flocking into ESG funds, and that seems to be a problem. Um, but, you know, we're not really judging what goes on in the market. If investors want something that is ESG, and if, as our data suggests, it is measurably different from the other alternatives in the market, you know, why exactly should regulation be concerned? Why is that a problem to be prevented? So, you know, I think that, you know, I, I've, I've, I've opened a door that probably, Steve, is too big for you to answer here. But, you know, if there is concrete evidence, we'd love to see it and examine it more carefully. Well, um, if, if I could, the, the um, all very interesting uh, input and comments from, from everybody. A uh, couple things I just wanted to offer in response, um, not necessarily in disagreement, but yes, on some things. Um, I think that that um, the label tweaking, I think Anne used it, uh, <laughs> is I think a little bit off the mark for, for really uh, three reasons. One is uh, a lot of the discussion, except for the, the last very reasonable question, uh, tends to gloss over the, the potential for abuse, the history of it and the potential for it going forward. Tweaks kind of uh, regulatory tweaks 
is doesn't really have an aperture to account for that. Um, and our, in our view, the scale of, of the ESG movement, the complexity, uh, the enormous popularity, which is a kind of engine or driver that in some ways is very good when you think about the larger issues at stake, is nevertheless, in our view, inherently perilous for investors and the financial industry, um, I hope I don't offend anybody, but in the view of better markets, uh, is always looking for opportunities uh, to make loads of money and to take advantage of this kind of context. The other thing is that tweaks, I think, in a sense, devalues the ESG disclosure rule that the S uh, SEC put out uh, and the names rule. I mean, one thing, um, you know, these, these are really important things. Uh, to, and, and as the SEC said in the release, it's both protective and it's it's constructive, it's helpful to the movement itself. Uh, and then finally, I would say that as we watch this, this fascinating and important uh, movement go forward and evolve yet further, I think we're gonna to need to be vigilant again, not be, not be too complacent and constantly look for new trends uh, and reasons to be concerned on both fronts. Is there, fresh abuse, new varieties of it? Uh, is there a need for even more disclosure requirements and guardrails? And then finally, on the, on the issue of, uh, of whether there really is much abuse, it's a, it's a very fair question. Uh, I didn't say this in my remarks. Uh, in an earlier draft, I had just a reference to the two enforcement actions last year against uh, BNY Mellon in Goldman Sachs in November of uh, 22, Mellon was May 22. Um, there's still reason for the SEC to be on alert uh, in accordance with its own risk alert. It, there's a reason why they're throwing lots of resources at that. And if it seems that all of those steps and the layering of regulation actually prevents abuse, that's an argument for those measures and, and their success, it's not an argument that we should just stand down. There you go. There, thank you. Um, I just want to see if Ann or Catherine want to jump in on this or if we should go to a question. Yeah, no, fair comment on Steve's part. I didn't mean to be um, pejorative at all using the word tweak. It was just relative to <laughs> what Steve's calling for is avoiding abuse and legitimizing a movement and getting more clarity, more disclosure. And I was only using the word tweak relative to these sort of blanket boycott bills that are happening. So I knew he wasn't going to like that word <laughs> the minute it came out. <laughs> but, but it does look like a, a deeper. Uh, I'll even, I'll even uh, thank you for that. I, I would say, I would modify it in a subtle but important way, the phrase you just used, which is to legitimize the movement. It, in our view, it's more about creating the, the regulatory environment that, that maintains the integrity uh, of, of it and lets it get as much legitimacy as it may deserve, as long as it doesn't victimize people uh, and deceive them, uh, and, and as long as it really gives them the information they, knew, they need in accordance with the, the cornerstone principle of securities law, which is you got to give them all the, all the material info, it's got to be truthful, it's got to be timely, and then let the market decide. And, and there, I think there's a lot of common mm -hmm. ground. For sure. And I think I shared Jill's question about if, there, if there's abuse, you know, let's, let's take a look at that. If people truly have been abused as a result. And I'll look forward to their article on the naming. Um, <laughs> and there's that. another a aspect that's important here. I think I, a lot of the work that I do is with social psychologists and looking at the role of social norms in steering behavior. And we all say that we make our own decisions. And yet we all tend to do what others around us are doing most of the time, even though we deny that that influences our behavior. Best way you can predict most behaviors is by looking at the circle of people around you. And as you increase the amount of attention on ESG funding and so forth, you create this sense of common behavior out there among corporate managers and investors mm -hmm. and, and uh, individual investors, investment managers. So I think there's also a value to having a fairly expansive approach to ESG just to create that sense that, hey, I'm doing what everyone else is doing. Mm -hmm. And that in and of itself could be an incredibly important driver in this area. Thomas, do you want to ask a question before we start to wrap up? Sure. So this is a question for the authors and the panelists. 
Um, the paper concludes that regulations might not be necessary because ESG funds deliver on the promises. Um, but I'm wondering, what are the environmental dangers, if any, of subjecting ESG funds to these heightened regulations? So, great question. Um, in the paper, we worry about um, regulatory uh, burden. Uh, obviously, one of the challenges in market regulation is if you increase regulatory burdens, you're going to limit innovation, you're going to uh, have uh, funds that are risk averse. Um, with respect to the names rules, since Steve spent a lot of time on that, one of our worries is that we won't have as much information conveyed through the name, right? A name is an imperfect measure, but I can always uh, stay clear of any names rule problem by calling my mutual fund fund A, fund A or the Magellan Fund and not calling it an ESG fund. Um, and since we know that a lot of investors use shortcuts, how are they going to find ESG funds if the name doesn't convey any information? Uh, with respect to uh, sort of other disclosure, uh, other disclosure is a great thing. Uh, fund, uh, investors should be able to know a fund's investment strategy, uh, what kinds of securities a fund excludes, uh, what kinds of factors it takes into account. As I said, we've been watching this space really carefully, and we've been looking not just at the fund names, but on the disclosure on fund web pages, on uh, the filings that funds already have to make with the SEC, and we see that funds provide a tremendous amount of information. So when we're talking about, well, funds should be required to provide more or funds should be required to standardize, right? Standardization is another word for, well, let's not have outliers or let's not have all possible investment strategies. Let's require funds to fit with one of the SEC's three proposed buckets. And we think that's costly when investors want a variety of different th uh, things and want to achieve different goals with how they invest. Yeah, so, I just wanna, uh, oh, go ahead. I, I, I just wanted to chime in. I'll, I'll wait my turn. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to say, uh, just seconding what Jill said, the other downside of standardization is this is, as we all know, a really young market. It's an evolving market. We don't know yet what the best or right or wrong, for that matter, um, answer is. And the more you impose regulation, the more you impose cost, the more you try to force standardization, we worry you're not going to get the innovation. We're not going to be able to get to the kinds of products that investors are going to want. Um, and we think that that's just like the downsides there, we think are also really important to weigh. Dave? Yes, uh, real quick. But on the names rule, I mean, the flip side of the coin already tossed out is of course that it is an extraordinarily powerful uh, influencer of investors. I mean, I think everybody in the room knows that that that's been a longstanding concern. Uh, and the fact is, there's there's repeated cases demonstrating that adding an ESG term to a name can basically overnight increase your flows dramatically. So it's it's sort of playing with dynamite. And that's why I think uh, that should trump the concerns about maybe struggling with how best to describe a fund. The, the short answer to the, the very good question that, that, that started off this round of discussion, to my way of thinking, is that in the long run, the additional regulatory requirements are, of course, going to be good for the environment as well as investors. That's our core thesis. Um, and finally, the the notion of regulatory burden, it, it is a constant refrain. It's, it's one reason why better markets remain uh, in business, because <laughs> we we feel the need to push back against the, 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 the contentions that regulation is overly costly, overly burdensome, uh, and, and also especially push back against the notion that it stifles innovation. Um, because we, we just don't see that. I mean, to the point made earlier, what's the evidence of abuse? Uh, let's have that discussion. I think it's very good. Uh, let's also have at the same time a discussion about, well, who is really in, in the financial markets, in the, in the fund space, who's really deserves sympathy because they couldn't innovate? Uh, let's find concrete examples of that. 
All right, you want to Great. Wrap it? So yeah. we're we're running out of time, uh, but I want to put two big ideas on the on the plate, just because this is both a policy event and an academic event. One is just, and I think Anne raised it, uh, the question of time. If I invest in a pension fund, I'm not that concerned about the returns next year and the year after. I really care that there's going to be a big pot of money in 10 or 20 or 30 years. And so how does that factor into all this? And I know it's hard for academics, uh, when you try to do this kind of research to look forward, you all were able to look two years backwards, which is incredibly helpful and a powerful paper. I'm just curious about how we deal with this question about whether these funds might perform better over time because they are considering factors that are going to grow in importance over time. That would be one. And the second big picture one, and if you can answer all these in 15 seconds, that would be awesome. The second one is uh, universal owner theory. So as we get more and more um, asset managers managing massive index funds, do they own the economy in effect and therefore benefit from uh, owning a large basket of, of stocks and therefore benef benefit from reducing the negative externalities of the companies in that basket rather than benefiting by any one company making more money? Does that, does that have an effect on our thinking here or what's the status of that looking forward? So in 15 seconds, um, uh, professors and any thoughts on either either the universal owner question or the the long-term horizon question um i'll give you 10 seconds on the long-term horizon um there are i guess our view is there's lots of different investing theses out there uh we don't typically say you know any particular kind of stock picking strategy is legal or illegal so if we have an investing strategy that says that there's going to be a transition that is going to mean that these particular companies are more valuable that's a pecuniary strategy that seems like a totally legitimate thing for a pension fiduciary to take into consideration doesn't need special regulation that just fits within our, our current framework perfectly Jill? as does the idea that if investor if investors want to buy ESG funds there's nothing surprising that uh, fund sponsors start ESG funds and that investment money then flows in right I don't think that our capital markets are set up to discourage um, uh, fund managers from offering the products that investors want to buy well, we're going to end um, on that note, but before we thank our panel with applause, I do want to hand it to Carolyn Berman, who is a third year Vanderbilt uh, law student, our executive editor, to wrap us up, and then we're going to uh, express our appreciation for the thoughtful discussion. Yes, we're going to kick off with, with some other appreciation, but I just want to thank everyone here for coming virtually and in person. Um, we also just really want to thank our panelists and our authors throughout the day who gave their time very graciously and a lot of energy to, to come and contribute to this event. Um, we're really grateful to ELI for being such an excellent partner to LPAR and for hosting this and, and doing so much to, to be a great partner to us. To the professors who do so much to contribute to a really excellent and unique educational opportunity. There are awful lot of students involved in making this happen today. I also really want to recognize Tori who contributed so much time and energy to helping this run smoothly and to making it all possible. Um, and then, you know, we just also want to let you know that if you're interested in learning more, um, the slide and the recording will be posted on the LPAR website next week. You can also find out more information about all this at the website. You can get a copy in August of the actual publication and we're on social media. And we also just want to invite everyone who is here in person to stay with us for a reception after we conclude. Thank you, Carolyn. And thank you to our panel. Thanks for being here. Thanks so much.